and we will start in a few minutes. But I thought we, before we get going, we have a, all our illustrious panelists here, and they're just getting ready. Uh, we've been in, in the COVID shutdown or lockdown for a few weeks now. I'm just curious uh, what, you, what, what you guys have been doing this week that you didn't do last week, because it's kind of getting monotonous. Anything different? Um, hiding better. I'm hiding. <laughs> I, uh, right, just... I found some new hiding places. Um, I'm exercising, taking long walks, you know, um, do, doing a little more ophthalmology stuff, doing a little more telemedicine um, with patients. You know, patients are calling in now and, you know, trying to deal with that, seeing a few emergencies. Yeah, I've been do I did about 20 virtual visits last uh, yesterday, um, either telephone calls or through doxy me. Um, so it's good to stay connected to patients and make sure that that uh, they know the importance of their follow up. Yeah, we've been doing a fair amount of virtual phone consults as well. It's, it's obviously hard with glaucoma, but mm -hmm. you know, just to be sure patients, um, prescription things and, and things along those lines have been what we've managed to do. What about LA, Nicole? What's happening in LA? Well, besides my son writing lyrics because he's really trying to get into getting his emotions out, um, we're trying to entertain my seven-year-old. And then in terms of the business, you know, we started uh, talking to new patients to kind of connect and make sure that patients knew that when we opened up, uh, we're going to be there for them. And that's been really great getting to know people and counseling ahead of time uh, before, you know, cataract visits and cornea visits. Um, and then, you know, just trying to keep up with how we're going to roll things out when this is over. Um, and how we're going to protect the staff and protect our patients. When do you think? When do you think we're going to get back in order, guys? What do you think? What is? What do you think, John? When? Do you, when are we going to get back into semi normalcy here? I'm hoping. Well, by, I mean, I think every. Uh, oh, sorry, too, John. Going sorry. To be, <laughs> going to be different, but uh, you know, I, I'm hoping you know mid May. You know, we can start uh, ramping things up safely. Randolph, what about you, Doctor Randolph? Yeah. So. I mean, we've been seeing probably 25 people a day still in the retina clinic, um, post-ops, injections. We've, we've done a, we've, what we've done is we have seven offices and so we've been six doctors. So we've broken up into teams. So we each have the same text and same front desk staff as we travel to the different locations. And then we spaced our appointments out by 20 minutes. So even though we're not seeing as many patients, we're there just as long. And so we're just trying to make sure that the waiting room's not cluttered and then just keep everyone, uh, keep everyone safe. So that's what we've been doing in Florida. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we've got, a, we've got about uh, 300 plus people already joined us and I see people are, are writing. And so tell us where you're from. Use the chat box, everybody. We got, we got Ravi goal here. So when Ravi's here, we, we know we can get started soon, but we've got uh, folks from uh, all over the U S from India, yeah. from Spain, from Ukraine, Chicago, Mr. Myers, good to see you. Paraguay, Brazil, Mexico. So we got a, Italy. Good to see Italy here. Fantastic. So we got a lot of people here. Um, and uh, again, those of you who have, have not used Zoom, which I think is going to be far and few between now with all the webinars, you can use the chat box uh, or the Q&A function uh, to interact with us. Uh, we'll be introducing the panelists very shortly. This has been a really a great opportunity for us to connect, uh, see each other, talk about things, learn a few things. Uh, share some ideas as well. Uh, we will, um, again, uh, take your questions as much as we can. Our panelists, I'm going to ask them to look at the uh, questions coming in the Q&A box and the chat box and, uh, and answer them as we go. And, of course, also interrupt our speakers as we go through it as well. <clears throat> to get things started, I'm going to ask Jeb, uh, Jeb Ong, who's helped organize these rounds, to get started and introduce uh, the rounds as well as our speakers and presenters. So off, on to you, Jeb. Excellent. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us on this beautiful Saturday. Just as a reminder, our website is www.prisminstitute.com slash webinars. And for any questions, uh, comments, please send those to ike.webinars at prismi.ca. This is just a reminder in terms of what type of presentations we're looking for in case you're interested. So whether it's a lecture, a case, or an article that you wish to review. Again, if you want to express your interest, send it out to ike.webinars at prismi.ca. We've been getting quite a few emails. Um, always appreciate it. Uh, our website has been updated, so now you'll be able to access previous uh, webinars. A lot of people have been asking about that. They are now up there. 
Uh, the YouTube links are there so you can rewatch them in case you uh, missed them the first time around. Um, and also, this is where you register for future webinars, okay? And we're, uh, one other question we've been getting a lot actually is we're looking into seeing if uh, CME credits can be applied for these. So if like, it wasn't a good enough reason for it to be here, then uh, there's also mm -hmm. working on to it. So this Wednesday, April 15th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Adrian Tang present low pressure perfusion glaucoma. And we're gonna have Dr. Ike Ahmed uh, present how to suture iris for the first time. And then we're gonna have Dr. Sebastian Gagne who's gonna talk about mind the gap, ciliary body cleft management. So that's this Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, so our first speaker today is Dr. Richard Schroeder. He's currently a glaucoma fellow at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. He did his residency there as well. On his, panels, we have, on his panel, we have Dr. John Lind, who's an associate professor of ophthalmology at Indiana University. He did his fellowship at Bascom Palmer in Miami and he did his residency at St. Louis University. We also have Dr. Tom, Thomas Schutt, who is a glaucoma and interior segment surgeon at IQ Vision Care in Fresno, California. He did his fellowship at Washington University in uh, St. Louis School of Medicine, and he did his residency there as well. We also have uh, Dr. Marjorie Carbonneau, who's a glaucoma and interior segment surgeon at CHUS in Sherbrooke, that's in Quebec. And she did her glaucoma and advanced interior segment surgery fellowship with uh, Ike Ahmed. And currently she, uh, well, pre pre previously she did her residency at uh, Sherbrooke as well. Our second speaker is Dr. Steve Safran, who's a bit of a jack of all trades here. He practices in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. He has a special interest in complex cataract surgery, lens exchange, endothelial keratoplasty, iris repair, glaucoma, and oculoplastics. He did a cornea fellowship at Duke University and he did his residency in New York. On this panel, we have Dr. Jordi Calzada, who's an adjunct professor of ophthalmology and vision science at the University of Nebraska. He founded the specialty clinic Deep Blue uh, Retina in Memphis, Tennessee. He did a retina surgery fellowship at the University of Tennessee, and he also did his residency there. And we have uh, Dr. Nicole Fram, who's a managing partner of Advanced Vision Care and clinical instructor of ophthalmology at the Stein Eye Institute at UCLA. She specializes in refractive cataract surgery, corneal disease, and complex cataract surgery. And all the way in the back of the class where the cool kids sit, we got all the retina guys. We have uh, Dr. Jordi Calzada again, who's uh, kindly agreed to present and be a panelist uh, today. And on his panel, we have Dr. John Randolph, who's a partner at the Center for Retina and Macular Disease in Windsor Haven, Florida. He did a VR surgery fellowship in Memphis, Tennessee, and he also uh, did his residency at the University of Miami School of Medicine. We also have Dr. Eric Sigler, who did his VR, who's a VR specialist in Long Island, New York, and did his VR uh, fellowship at Charles Retina Institute and Hamilton Eye Institute, and he did his residency at Yale Eye Center. So Ike has a few words. I'm going to give it back to him. Thanks a lot, uh, Jeff, for putting it together. We'll get Richard uh, Schroeder to maybe share his screen as we transition. And I want to thank again all of the speakers and panelists for being here. Um, I think just the camaraderie, just of doing this and getting together, it means a lot to uh, all of us, and I'm sure for you as well around the world. And it's such a global world. And, and if anything, we know this, of course, from the pandemic we're all mm -hmm. facing, but also from the way we've come together um, in many different ways. And I know the struggle that uh, you all have had, we all have. Many of us have been touched directly or indirectly by this, uh, by this terrible virus and the impact it's had on our practices, on our families, and those in our community. And we wish those that are sick uh, to make a, a fast and smooth recovery. We pray for those who have not, unfortunately, to make it, um, may they rest in peace. Uh, there will be, of course, uh, an end to this in some form or fashion, in some new normal. And uh, I think all of us, it's going to be important that we are tuned. Uh, things will be different. It's also, also an opportunity for us to really find a new way to innovate and do things differently. And for many of us that I think a lot of people on this panel, I would say, are disruptors, are in some way shit disturbers, and I'm not looking at any of you specifically, but this is when we need you. We need you now because we need to think differently. We need to do things vast differently. And if we do things the same way, we're not necessarily going to find the answer here. So although we're not epidemiologists, we're not ID people, we're not ICU intensivists, at least not I, I'm not. I think we can contribute a lot in terms of how we're going to be getting through this, whether it's professionally or personally. Webinars are just a way for us to kind of connect and be together. And uh, I haven't been home and not in the air for this long. I think I can't, since I can remember, uh, my little girl's happy, but uh, and I'm 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 fairly happy with the new norm for now. But um, it is something that uh, I know has been a big difference. But this is the way the way for us to be in, to stay together and do something. So with that, Richard, I'm going to hand it off to you and our panelists as well, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. So thank you. Awesome. 
Thanks, Ike. My name is Rich Schrader. I'm a glaucoma fellow at WashU, and I feel very lucky to be presenting to such a cool crowd today. Um, I have a case presentation for you. It's kind of a twist on angle closure, and I, I'm anxious to hear what the panelists would do for this. It's kind of a what would you do surgical situation. I have no financial disclosures. So this was a 48-year-old lady who is referred to me um, by one of our retina specialists for unilateral elevated intraocular pressure. And so her story is she had no real ocular history until about three or four months ago. She went to her optometrist. Her chief complaint was actually anisocoria that she had kind of a dilated pupil on the right side, although she did have blurred vision, some light sensitivity there. Um, and the optometrist was very struck by inflammation, not just in the right eye, but in both eyes and both the interior segment and in the vitreous. Um, pressure was also 30 on the right side at that initial visit. So that optometrist started um, topical steroids, called the PCP for the patient, made a medication change, which I'll leave you in suspense for at the moment, um, but referred to retina um, at one of the institutions in St. Louis. And that retina doctor also thought that there was a fair amount of inflammation in the eye, even saw some vitreous opacities more on the right side than the left um, that he thought was like snowballing, snowbanking. Um, so he referred to one of the retina specialists at our institution who also does a lot of uveitis. Um, at the time that she saw the patient, she wasn't as struck with inflammation in the eye. She did think there was some cell in the anterior vitreous. Um, both of the retina providers did a fluorescein angiogram, which showed a hot nerve on both sides um, with some peripheral leakage. So kind of unusual um, fluorescein angiograms. And what our retina provider did was they... Um, first got like a systemic, like a brief systemic workup for infectious etiologies of inflammation. Um, kind of the classic bad actors were negative uh, for syphilis, TB, also sarcoid. Um, and once those were negative, she started the patients on oral steroids, patient on oral steroids to kind of just try and knock out all this inflammation. Um, throughout this period, this is now about three months um, after her initial presentation, um, her pressure has been in the 30s up to the low 40s. Um, topical medications have been escalated during this time. So by the time she saw me, she was already on, um, on four agents. So I do need to tell you something about this patient, um, which is that she has a pretty significant medical history um, of metastatic melanoma. And um, the story with her is that in 2011, she had a uh, flank lesion, um, which was resected and found to be a uh, malignant melanoma. She had a sentinel node um, biopsy at the time, which was negative. So she lived her life for about the next eight years and then unfortunately developed um, swelling in her neck, um, which turned out to be uh, melanoma on biopsy and then um, got a pretty full, obviously, uh, oncology workup after that. And she was found to have um, METS in her perineum as well as her chest wall. So in May of last year, she was started on two agents for immunotherapy. Um, I'll talk about them more in a second, um, but Mechanist and Taplinar were the two. Um, and she actually responded pretty well to that. Her follow-up um, PET scans showed that the, her tumors were actually shrinking. Um, she was doing well and apparently doing um, well with this regimen. And it was about four months after that that she uh, presented with the ocular symptoms that I just talked about. So these two medications, um, unless you're much more savvy in uh, the immunotherapy literature than I am, you probably haven't heard of these either. Um, so mechanist and taflonar, also known as trametinib and diprapanib, are two like kind of synergistic medic medications that work on a MAP kinase and BRAF mutation pathway. Um, they have been described before to have some ocular side effects, um, but it's more like case reports. Like there's only been a, a few scattered ones. The most common presentation has seemed to be um, like a central serous retinopathy kind of thing, um, but just various types of uveitis have been reported with it. So at the time that she came to me, the, the running theory was that she had um, gotten uveitis as a response to these medications. Her optometrist had spoken with her oncologist and stopped both of these um, at the time that um, she had been started on uh, topical steroids. So she had gone for a couple of months without them. Um, and so the, the thinking was that the, the uveitis had been from that. And at this point now she's on topical steroids, she's on oral steroids, and she's on um, a number of glaucoma medications as well. So now she comes to my office, it's time to examine her. I don't know what you guys have been up to during the coronavirus uh, quarantines, but we have been drilling ophthalmology exams in my house, um, <laughs> trying to pass things on to the next generation. 
uh, it's not going particularly well. She tells me there's no role for a direct ophthalmoscopy anymore. And I tell her to mind her business and learn how to go to the bathroom on her own. <laughs> In any case, um, so patient's in front of me now, and there are a couple of things to know about her exam. So vision's 20-20 in the right eye, but she's telling us like the quality of her vision is very poor and she can notice a peripheral field deficit. Um, her, her pupil exam is unusual. She has, um, or abnormal, she's got an APD on the right side by reverse. That pupil is about six millimeters, doesn't react really. Um, pressure is still very high on her current regimen at 44. And then the most remarkable thing to me about her exam was her anterior chamber, which was that although um, both sides were quiet when she saw me, she was very shallow. Um, just even by Von Herrick, you could tell there was going to be an issue with her. Um, clear lenses, no cataract. And on the right side, you know, paid kind of special attention to her iris. There were no segmental abnormalities or segmental paralysis um, to suggest like an 80s pupil or anything like that. Rich, did she, uh, did she have any posterior synechiae at all? She had no posterior sneakier that I can see, um, uh, see right now, no. Um, and so that was her anterior segment. Both sides were pretty symmetric. They looked about evenly shallow on, on, on either side. And then on gonioscopy, um, very narrow. So I could, in, again, both eyes somewhat symmetric. Um, I could see a little bit of Schwalbe's line um, on, on both sides, but for more than 180 degrees, um, she had what looked like appositional closure to me. Um, she did open to compression though, and I could see the TM on both sides, um, with the exception of some PAS that she had on the uh, on the right eye. Um, the pigmentation also, I'll just say, of the TM was was pretty symmetric and lightly pigmented um, OU. And then in her um, in her posterior exam, I did not think that she had any inflammation posteriorly. I I didn't think she really had any um, retinal abnormalities to my eyes. Um, which isn't saying too much, but there it is. And uh, her nerve was cupped uh, for sure on the right eye. So she had inferior thinning um, and a 0.8 cup. That was um, kind of supported by the OCT, which showed um, inferior more than superior thinning. Um, and the left eye, totally normal as far as like the appearance of the optic nerve to me as well as her OCT. I'm a uh, Rena guy here, Jordy. <clears throat> um, out of curiosity, do you have anything about the choroid? Could, was, could the choroid have been thickened either an examination or an ultrasound? Um, I don't have an ultrasound. Um, we, um, I, I have a UVM, which, which doesn't really show any like effusion or particular thickening of the choroid, but I don't have like, uh, it's a great question. I don't have a, a U or a, uh, B scan that like showed a thickened choroid though. Hey Jordan, I'm just curious why you asked that question. I, it's a good question. I'm just curious why you asked that. Well, because there's a lot of these panuveitis that have a choroidal component. And if you don't think about it, you, the, the anterior segment disease may be just a consequence of a, of, of a choroiditis or he mentioned serous retinal detachments. So, so that, that's always a my differential, you know, uh, the, from your perspective, like the equivalent of a of a ureofusial syndrome, just not, not an effusion syndrome, just a true inflammatory component. You can have rotation of the angle that way. I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding why one eye has this problem and not the other, if we're assuming that there's some degree of systemic disease from, or associated to the medications, you know, the unilaterality. Yeah, it's a good thought. And her, her gonio ridge was pretty, pretty symmetric too. She had a couple of clock hours of PAS both sides. Just the right eye had PAS. Just the right eye. So the, the gross appearance and like the first look in the gonier mirror was pretty similar, um, but the, the left eye didn't have PAS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like the idea of a B scan. I, you know, we've been doing them more and more, even for patients who don't have any of systemic questions, because there's sometimes a lot of information you get. Even you get a thickened cord or an effusion or an anterior effusion, it can just help us to understand the mechanism, what's going on here. It can prepare us surgically as well. So if you have access to imaging, and I, I think I think that uh, Richard will show us more, but um, you know, anterior segment, but also uh, a B scan, I think can be can be quite informative. So I, I actually like that. Um, in nanophthalmic eyes, we do it routinely. We often find something back there that can help us prepare surgically or help diagnostically. So I like the idea of that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I will show some imaging again. I don't, I, I don't have the B scan. I agree, it would have been a really good idea. Um, so here are her visual fields. So she did not do particularly well in either eye um, with Humphrey visual fields, even though the parameters were pretty good in the left eye. Um, I think overall it was an unreliable field. Um, she had pretty fair cooperation at best. Um, and her, like she definitely, I don't think that she has like arc rates, you know, inferior and superior on the left eye. 
And on the right, they started doing a Humphrey, but she really just like couldn't participate with it at all. got frustrated quickly. So they switched to doing a Goldman and the Goldman does show like a fairly um, severe deficit close to fixation um, with like pretty significant nasal constriction. Um, any comment from the panelists on these fields or things you're thinking about? So I need to say thank you for doing a Goldman. I'm not sure if anybody still does them. <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask while you're adding to the glaucoma people, what do you guys think about the automated perimetry with, uh, with the Octopus uh, 900? Hey, what, what's this retina guy crashing our glaucoma? <laughs> really, really, Jordy, really. <laughs> the glaucoma guy wants to know about the Octopus visual field. <laughs> I actually don't have any experience with Octopus. Uh, uh, it's not been available at any of the institutions I've been at. Um, I, you know, I do think that there's uh, good utility in it, especially with the parts of uh, gold mons being very much more scarce uh, over time. Uh, going to Rich's question, when I first saw these visual fields, I was initially was kind of struck by the verticality of the visual field deficit uh, in the left eye and in someone with metastatic cancer. Um, mm -hmm. that, that I think was a, a concern of mine. Obviously, there's not a strong evidence of verticality of a visual field defect in the left eye, but I think that was something to, to consider. It would, it would probably relieve you to know then that she just had an MRI about two weeks ago, um, which was negative for METS. Um, she had not yet seen neuro-ophthalmology at this point, but um, she did end up having one of our neuro-ophthalmologists um, as well going through her scans and didn't think that there was anything suspicious going on um, her afferent pathway from that perspective. And also like, yeah, I, I don't do um, octopus very often. We, like, because of the issue of availability of gold mons and kind of the variability with it too, we started doing more size five stimulus for like some of these like severe glaucoma patients. Do you guys do that at all? Yeah, I, I do that in my practice. I think that can be helpful. Like, like you were saying with people who have more severe glaucoma, um, it still can give you an idea of the pattern at least. Still can, you can get a better reliability sometimes. Yeah, a lot of times with the severe POAGs, I get a gold mount and I think, wow, that's really bad. And then they get their next gold mount to compare and it's just a, also a really bad but different looking gold mount. And so you think, yeah, that's also bad. So I don't know, sometimes I, I struggle with the gold mounds at, at towards like the end of the disease spectrum, but it is something. And I think kind of like a similar thing, the size five can be something, but I, I think might be a little bit more reproducible just because of the technician uh, variability. So, um, I also want to kick it again right back to the panelists. Here's a um, UBM. This is just her right eye. I don't have any images um, to show you right now from her left. But um, any thoughts on the appearance of this angle? Yeah. So I mean, you can you can see here that she's she has very narrow angles. If I don't have the pointer rich, so maybe you can show everybody where the scleral spur is. Um, but you can see the corneal wedge ending right there and then scleral spur a little bit posterior to it. And that iris is very anterior. The other thing that you notice is there is a little bit of pupillary block component to this. So you said there was no, no pupillary or no uh, posterior synechia, no sort of membrane. Right. So it looks like there is a little bit of relative pupillary block. And looking at the ciliary body too, it looks like that might be a little bit anterior um to me it doesn't look like i mean we're, we're obviously very anterior with this imaging but i don't see any um at least any anterior sort of effusion um but it would be nice because it does look like that ciliary body maybe is a little anterior it would be nice to see what is going on with the choroid if there's some thickening kind of pushing everything forward a little bit yeah, I'm, we had fairly similar uh, reactions. You know, when I had first looked at her um, on exam, I thought just like the, the shape of her iris was kind of plateau-like. Like I thought it was more flat. And then the UBM didn't really, um, I, I don't think this particularly looks like a plateau iris besides like the ciliary body being kind of like anterior, but you know, yep, anterior bowing of the iris there. I agree that it kind of looks like pupil block um, or at least, you know, like- the At least the component of it, yeah. Um, and like angle closure. I mean, this kind of, at first I was thinking, okay, maybe we have like a bad uveitic for some reason, you know, uveitic worse on one side glaucoma. And then she also has kind of like narrow 
angles in a plateau, but um, the, UV, the uh, UBM had me more kind of thinking like angle closure mechanism. And I totally agree. It would be nice to have a B scan. I wish I had it. One of those hindsight would have gotten it things. Rich, there's a question from the audience about the refraction of the patient. Do you know what the refraction was? I know you know the axial length, but uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, she was emotropic. Um, she did not, I mean, her, she was 2020 OU uncorrected. So um, this was just zoomed in on um, those same images from the last uh, from the last slide. So here's her biometry too. You know, wondering about how short her eye might be. And I, I mean, it's like it's not like she's nanophthalmic by any means. Definitely on like the shorter side at like 22 and a half on both sides, um, and a, a, a low ACD, but nothing crazy. Um, also, kind of a shorter white to white. Um, so a, a smallish eye, but um, nothing, nothing um, too bad. So I did want to kind of pull the audience right now, um, you know, to just kind of summarize, we have a patient who has, you know, some type of inflammatory process probably that has gone on, but a lot of physical exam signs of angle closure, pressures 44 on max topical meds. I think there would be a number of ways to approach this. Definitely like a number of ways that I debated going about this. Um, so you can that there and I wonder if you could Rich uh she was not on Diamox at this point correct not on Diamox maybe I should have made another bubble bubble for Diamox for Tommy but it's a good thought but she was not on it yet I just think it, that's that's an option if you're you know you needed to buy some time and and that can temporize you a little bit um if if you need to consider you need to you know have a webinar and pull 500 experts throughout the world kind of thing <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to bring Marjorie in this one because I think even before this, I mean, this is a very interesting case because whenever we talk about glaucoma, uh, unlike the retina guys who are just thinking about flat or not flat, we are thinking about mechanistically. Why is the pressure elevated? That's the first question to ask. Yeah. And of course, we can go through a decision tree on this. And there's so many possibilities on this, which can be local or generalized in terms of their ideology. So, I mean, Marjorie, do you have kind of a sense of how you're going to approach this in terms of the before even thinking about surgery, what the mechanism, like why is the pressure elevated? Yes, so, yeah, uh, so, yeah, I agree. I, I think we have first to, to think about what's the mechanism here. And I think there are a couple of mechanisms involved here. So uh, angle closure, but it's not only, probably not only that considering the other eye also have some closure too, but we have some closure from PAS and we also have possible component of uveitis. But when you saw the patient, both eyes were quiet at this time, but on, only three to four months ago that there, there were still some inflammation. So I think we have to, 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 to still consider that. And also probably some steroid response um, involved also. So there are a couple of, of things here that we have to consider, but my main, con my main, um, my main uh, consideration here is the, the uveitis and the, the PAS progressing probably from uveitis and angle closure. So in this kind of patient, I I, I won't go with um, with uh, goniosynechialysis or ECP. I, I think in this case, uh, the risk of recurrence of PAS is quite high considering the uveitis um, uh, uh, background and also um, the ECP could in some patient um, create lots of inflammation, especially uh, uh, in case of uveitis. So yeah, it, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Marjorie, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, if you just show those images, Richard, and, and said, listen, this patient has a pressure of 40, uh, I think most of us would be like, okay, that looks like angle closure. The imaging shows that the iris is appositionally against the angle. It looks like a relatively normal eye with a shallow anterior chamber. It looks The story process it looked a bit anteriorized to me. And although there's some people block, I would say, well, you know, I would think about plateau here. The lens did not look excessively thick or anteriorly positioned. So it's unlikely to be a large lens or something pushing from posteriorly. But in this case, we've got multiple other confounders. And one of those big confounders, of course, is the metastatic melanoma. We've got the immunotherapy. Both of these can cause... Uh, certainly an open angle mechanism of elevated pressure. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is there an underlying open angle mechanism that may be also in the background of this case as well? Immunotherapy, you know, they've been published reports, and we, we, we published a report 
of the immunotherapy like this causing elevated pressure, but usually it's bilateral though. And as Jordi said, it's kind of unusual why it's only one eye. Mm -hmm. um, so I think- she, you know, she, had, she had uveitis in both eyes at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, but the pressure was only elevated in yes. one. What I'm speaking mm -hmm. about a, a non-uveitic non immunological mm -hmm. elevation of IOP. So yeah. that can also occur with these therapies. That's why you got to mm -hmm. have it in the back of your mind. And then as Marjorie said, you got uveitis, you got steroid. So there's so many confounders in this that that's, that's why you brought this up, Richard, of course, to kind of make us think uh, mechanistically. Angle closure, open angle glaucoma. Angle closure, is it just primary angle closure or is it a, is it a, is it a push or pushing mechanism? And is there superimposed me uh, melanoma seeding? Is there a mass effect somewhere from the melanoma? And open angle, of course, we got the same issues with regards to you know uh, melanoma seeding. Uh, we've got immunotherapy issues around the steroid and and also uveitis. So it's a complicated case. Uh, let me just show the, let me show the results of the poll, Richard, and I'll let you speak to it. Uh, let me see. I'm still not seeing them yet. Oh, here let me we go. Share it there. So a lot of people would do an LPI. Um, definitely, uh, that would be a way to go. Looks like a. The next popular one was doing FACO plus a big gun, as I would call it. And then a decent amount of people would do FACO MIGs here. Um, but LPI is, is the winner. I was a little concerned about the time about, you know, like that not being enough. You know, like you have a pressure of 44 on everything. Like is the pupil block component enough that to just do an LPI and would that save you? And I thought and she, probably, already, she already have an EPD. So yeah, that's yeah. probably yes, something... Yeah advanced process that the visual field defect seems to be quite uh, important also so yeah i, I was i was yeah. thinking surgery um when i saw her for sure um and then fake omig so what what migs would you guys do if you were if you were gonna do this case let's say we don't go to fake big gun yet what would you do um along with your faco so you know you you mentioned there were a couple of clock hours of pas and they weren't nasal but a couple of clock hours of pas you know she's also grade zero right so she's grade zero 360 it sounds like with a couple of, of clock hours of pas i don't know that you would need gonia synechiolysis um but and you know with uveitis it, it that area can scar down again but there's been some success reported with goniotomies and uveitic patients if she's well controlled right now you hope that she can be well controlled in the future on her immunomodulatory therapy. Um, that wouldn't be an, a bad option as far as I'm concerned. You could try phaco goniotomy and you're going to watch, you're obviously going to watch her closely, see what her pressures do. You, you'd be able to see if she starts to form that PAS in your area of goniotomy. I don't think I would do something like a hydrus. I mean, I wouldn't do something like a hydrus in this patient with that very narrow angle. Um, but a goniotomy, I think, might might be a good option, and then you just watch her closely. The the effects that I've seen when, in people who have this narrow angle with even with uveitis, it can be pretty profound. You can have some pretty significant pressure lowering with a phaco. Phaco alone could do it, but phaco with goniotomy can augment that pressure lowering a little bit. So I I if I was going to do if I was going to do sort of an incremental approach to surgery, I do a phagogoniotomy, watch her closely. And if she started to sneak down in that area again, or if the pressure started to climb up, you still have Diamox in your back pocket. You could opt for a tube or a Zen afterwards once the patient, patient's pseudophagic. Would anyone go more aggressive? Um, think about doing a, uh, a big gun, so to speak. Anybody want to put a tube in? Each time I hear about this case, I, I actually think about something a little bit different. So, you know, when you think about the mechanisms here, um, I think doing a FACO is definitely the right thing to do because that will hopefully relieve the pupillary block component and hopefully open up the angle. My initial impression was, you know, the patients on four drops, uh, their pressure's mid 40s. Um, they need a FACO tube. You know, they have a, a pointy nerve with uh, uh, approaching fixation. Uh, so that was my initial uh, thought. Um, obviously, you worry about snuff out in the patient. Uh, but my initial thought is, you know, what's the best chance of doing one surgery to get this patient uh, with probably a limited lifespan uh, with metastatic uh, melanoma? Um, you know, that was my initial thought. 
And then, you know, there, there are studies looking at both steroid response and uh, UVA glaucoma where trabeculotomies actually has more than probably a 50% success rate. Um, so if you wanted to get the patient a chance to recover more quickly, um, I, I agree with Tommy. I think it'd be very reasonable to do a, to do cataract extraction with goniotomy and, and hopefully the patient would, um, you know, recover much more quickly from this sort of surgery. It's much less invasive and you don't burn bridges. Um, so, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, talking to the patient to try to, to try to figure out what's best for them, you know, their current health state, their future prognosis uh, of their overall health. And, and you know, it, I, I think uh, uh, both of those approaches, I think, would be very reasonable. Also, you know, considering as then the patient seems to be quiet now for a while, uh, it's a pretty minimally invasive surgery. Um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, cataract extraction with Zen in a, in a normal patient, but, uh, you know, a patient that doesn't have uveitis. Uh, but, you know, I think a Zen could be a, a potential option too in this case. I don't think I would go to a TRAB, uh, but, uh, you know, it, 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 those are my thoughts. The other thing about the PI is interesting to me that, that everyone, that there was such a sort of people were favoring the PI. PI in a uveitic is pretty inflammatory. That that can close up on you, but at the same time, you're going to learn something about the mechanism as well. So if you get that PI open, at least you're going to be able to see in the interim that it is open, determine how much of that was due to pupillary block versus is there another posterior pushing mechanism going on. So doing a PI, um, it, it, it can be sort of diagnostic as well. So that would be something that could be minimally invasive. But again, you're up against the clock here because she's got pressures in the mid forties, a cup nerve and, and sight threatening glaucoma. I've yep. tried uh, to do TRAD on a kind of patient like that, like quiet eye with previous uveitis. And in the early post-op, um, two of my patients developed like intense inflammation after the surgery. So they were kind of hyposecreting and the pressure was always low. So I couldn't uh, cut any stitch on my TRAB. And what happened after three, about three, four weeks, so the TRAB scarred down and then the pressure rise uh, quite higher after. So I think TRABs sometimes can be, um, even if the eyes seems to be quiet, um, if it's only like here three, four months ago uh, that she had inflammation, I think TRABs could be uh, still very, um, uh, have a tendency to, to, um, to scar down after. So I, I think I would go with a tube here and probably an Ahmed to reduce the, um, the chance of, um, of hypotony after uh, the, the, the surgery. Would you do the Ahmed without doing the cataract surgery? in the angle so uh, shallow? I, I think in this patient, like she's 48 years old, she's probably already presbyopic. I, I think if the patient would be much younger without cataract, I would not remove the lens. But now 48 years old, she would probably need some cortisone on long-term basis and will probably develop cataract from cortisone, from uveitis, from probably her shallow anterior chamber. So. I, I think with her, I would definitely remove the lens, even if there's no cataract actually, just because I, I see many patients developing significant cataract just over a few months after. So I, I think in this case, I would do both at the same time. Hey, Richard, we're gonna let you finish off maybe just for a couple of minutes here and let us know what you did. It's a really good, really good case. Yeah, so um, we had similar thoughts to a lot of you. Um, I ended up thinking that it wasn't physically possible to really safely put a tube in without taking the lens out. Um, and with a with something going on with angle closure as well, um, the surgery we ended up doing was a FACO Ahmed. Um, I did take a look with a gonio mirror um, after the lens came out to see um, what was going on with the PAS. I, I was thinking at the time, like it might, it might be worth to try to do okay. some goniosyneculysis. Um, but just the FACO alone and putting the viscoelastic in um, was enough to break the P to broke the um, gonosynechiae. So she actually did really well. Um, she's now about two months out. She's had pressures from like low teens to mid teens in that right eye off meds. Um, interestingly, her angle did open up afterwards. Um, so I, I guess that'll be relevant to my next question. But um, I. 
mechanistically, again, like I think the challenge when deciding the surgery was deciding what you thought the mechanism was. And because I was worried about uveitis being a player steroids, I was maybe not as convinced because she presented with a high pressure before she was on steroids. Um, but definitely she's on steroids now and um, the pressure's high. So I think all of those things made me want to be a little bit more aggressive with the surgery and put in an Ahmed. Um, so that's what we did. Um, final quick question um, as we're wrapping up would be, what would you do for her second eye? So kind of similar looking um, eye in terms of like the spatial arrangement of it, but no cataract, no glaucoma damage and no elevated IOP. Uh, Rich, we have a question before that uh, about uh, where did you put the tube? Did you put it in the sulcus or anterior to iris? I put it in the AC. I thought I put it anterior to iris. Um, that's my typical place to put a tube. I, I thought after the um, lens came out that there was enough space. Um, in post-op, I, I think it looks reasonably far away from the cornea, but no, it wouldn't have been a bad idea to put it in the sulcus too. I think just how young she is and to try to let her cornea have a long life. So uh, laser iridotomy is the winner. Um, that's also kind of what I've decided to do for her. Um, I spoke with her on the phone last week because um, she couldn't keep her appointment because of coronavirus. And uh, I told her I was gonna get, you know, around 500 people to tell me what the right answer was. So six <laughs> will we'll, we'll support that decision. So um, thank you guys so much, real pleasure to present. Thank you to the panelists and uh, I will kick it back to the moderator. Thanks, Richard. That was fantastic. I mean, a lot of things to discuss here. Um, and I know we didn't have enough time, but in the back of my mind, we're always thinking about this melanoma history, systemic issues, as you mentioned, the immunotherapy, the steroids and everything else. I think you managed it exactly as I would actually. So well done. We're going to get Steve Safran to, um, to start sharing his screen. And, and thank you again, Richard, for doing that. We're blessed to have, uh, you know, great presentations. And that was fantastic. We have about 420 folks that are logged in right now and, and, and a number on YouTube as well. So we're actually broadcasting on both. And usually um, that's an effective way to get things out. Steve, are you able to share your screen yet? Um, yeah, you should be able to say it. Can you, can Not you say yet. it? Not yet. Um, there you go, can Steve. Can you say it? Okay. Uh, there so we go. Steve, Steve is always, always, a, always a great uh, you know, talk, a great speaker and a great surgeon and talks about different uh, entry segment complexities. Um, he's going to speak about IOL challenges, and we got a great panelist here. We also got some retina folks to keep them honest uh, as well. So, uh, Steve, I'll hand it over to you, and we look forward to hearing about your cases. All right, thank you, thank you very much. I, um, let me just see if I can get this to move forward. Okay, there we go. Uh, my talk, I'm going to be presenting a series of cases. It's called "Delicate and Dangling: Use It or Lose It," and. Um, I'm gonna start with this case. This is a um, 74 monocular rabbi. He has a history of chronic uveitis. He's been quiet for a few years. He's the editor of a large publishing company. And the other eye has poor visual potential. He's had a retina detachment, macula off, a lens bag complex sitting on the retina. That eye is only LP vision. So this is his good eye. And you can see when you look at it, uh, his pupil does not dilate well. When the cataract surgery is done, they sutured it. You can see the lens bag complex is sunken, jiggling around. And you can see that the capsular bag is very thin and friable. Uh, this is sort of what we call a dead bag. So, you know, what are the options in a case like this? Um, well, we can lasso it, which is use it, or we can remove and replace, uh, which is lose it. Um, and when I see a case like this, some of the things I'm thinking about, um, is this a lens I wanna keep? You know, the right power, is it scratched? Is it pitted from YAG laser? Uh, the lens and haptics in the bag, or are they out of the bag? Because if the lens haptics aren't in the bag, I don't like to lasso them. There's nothing to hold on to. Are the haptics crimped or damaged? Is there a CTR in the bag I can take advantage? That's gonna be harder to remove and I can use that to my advantage. Is there enough capsule strength integrity to last through the bag or is it gonna be very cheesy? Is there a large shimmering's ring which could cause problems? Is it possible to reopen the bag and put segments in? Is there a glaucoma bleg that I have to avoid damaging and think about? Is there conjunctival recession from a previous buckle or scleral thinning? Is there vitreous in the interchamber chamber we're gonna to have to deal with? If this is a vitrectomized eye, that might change my approach because there's no cushion, this lens could drop very easily during manipulation. And then, especially in a vitrectomized eye, you have to think, where is the lens when you lie the patient flat? Will it still be there by the time you get the patient to the OR? Because a lens that looks like this at the slit lamp 
And this is the same patient when I took him to the OR. You can see lying flat, the lens is dangling in the breeze. And if there's a delay getting the patient to surgery, you may see something like this by the time you get there. And we're kind of seeing an epidemic of these now. So this is the first case I uh, want to ask for some comments on. This is a self-referred 70-year-old woman. She has a complaint of decreased vision two years after cataract surgery in the right eye. She paid extra for a special lens. As you can see, it's a torque lens. You can see the hat, the, uh, the torque line there. Um, her refraction is plus two, minus 250 at 130 in this eye. Uh, she has a 21 diopter T3 torque, inferior dislocated, and at 118 degrees. And you can see this is a big zonular dialysis here. Uh, the lens is sunken down this way. And um, you can see she has hyperopic astigmatism. Now, normally when I'm thinking of exchanging a lens, I'll refract the patient, take their refraction and plug it in. But in this case, you really cannot do that because the um, lens is tilted and decentered. And so you're gonna get hyperopic astigmatism just from that. So when I plug this patient, I measure her, I measure her case, I measure axial length, and I take the AC depth from the other eye and I plug that into Barrett. And what Barrett tells me is that a 21 diopter T3 torque, um, let me just shrink this here, 21 diopter T3 torque would be the right lens for her and actually give a minus 0.8 outcome refractive with very little astigmatism if it were at this axis at 49 degrees, but it's actually sitting over here at this axis at 120 degrees. So it's dislocated down and the lens is uh, on the wrong axis and that's contributing to her astigmatism. So the question is, should we use this lens or should we use this lens? And uh, I wanted to ask the panelists, uh, I don't see Nicole's face up here, but uh, here. Nicole, you're out so, there. You know, there you are. I see I Ike. That one of the questions you need to ask is why is this lens dislocating this early after surgery? It doesn't look like there's pseudoexfoliative changes as the pupil dilates well. Um, so, but it was a 21 diopter lens, so it wasn't a high myope. So this is probably from surgical um, iatrogenic causes, or it just happens. Um, yeah, her surgery was a little over a year earlier. I think it was about 18 months earlier. I don't remember exactly the time frame. It was over a year out. So um, I, did, you know, it's yeah. also a T3. So although you want to be perfect and on the right axis, I don't think being off axis is going to be that difficult. And Ahuda Sia has taught us that if we can use the lens and refixate it safely, that it's often in the best interest of the patient. The other thing you notice is that there's not a lot of summerings ring here. So you won't have um, an UGG syndrome from asymmetric summerings or calcific summerings. So in these cases, I usually, if they are vitrectomized, I'll do a pars plane, a basket suture, where you take a tenoproline and go across the eye in a crisscross pattern and kind of sit the IOL where I want it to be, and then go ahead and do a lasso. So I would probably lasso this lens um, and I probably wouldn't worry about being on axis, although being able to get the toric back on axis can be ideal. Okay. Um, all right, well, I, I um, agree with you that in this case, I felt it was best to use the lens. And um, I'm gonna show the technique that I use. I have a lassoing technique that I like very much using a 30 gauge needle with Gore-Tex. Um, and uh, this video kind of shows this technique. Um, I'm gonna make my paracentesis first, fill the anterior chamber with uh, dispersive viscoelastic. And what I'm gonna do is make my radial scleral grooves, not on the axis that the lens is at, but on the axis I'm going to want to put the lens to correct the astigmatism. Here you can see I've marked the axis where I want the lens hatch march to six. And that's uh, 49 degrees to correct the astigmatism. And then because there's no zonules, this patient has really weak zonules, I can just rotate the whole lens band complex uh, on top, you know, sitting on top of the intrahyloid, and I'll just rotate the whole lens bag complex to the axis I want the lens to sit. And now I'm just going to use this 30 gauge uh, lassoing technique uh, to go ahead and lasso this. So this is a 30 gauge needle. There's a Gore-Tex suture fed into the lumen of the needle. That goes through the sclerotomy that's three and a half millimeters post to the limbus. I now use a 25 gauge forceps and grab the other half of the suture. 
Uh, I'll now take the 30 gauge needle on the other side, pass through the uh, capsule bag. I'm piercing through the capsule bag. Uh, I'm holding this uh, Gore-Tex suture, and now I'll come over the haptic and retrieve the other half uh, here. And uh, now I will uh, adjust the tension on these. And this is using a slip knot. Uh, you really don't need to tie this tight. You don't, you don't want it too tight. Uh, you want to just tighten up so that you don't have a lot of slack so that the suture is likely to road. I have a scleral groove here, and I want the suture to sit at the base of the scleral groove. I'm going to tuck the knot into sclera, and then the, uh, um, the Gore-Tex will be sitting at the base of the scleral groove. It'll be under the surface of the eye, so it's very unlikely to erode. Uh, in this case, um, a lot of these cases where I last sue, uh, especially if they have, you can see the Summering's ring kind of flip forward. I'm concerned about uh, the possibility of vitreous coming forward. And this patient, she had a lot of floaters as well. Uh, so I decided to just go ahead and do a, a vitrectomy here, part plane of vitrectomy uh, to clean things up. I did stain and see some vitro, vitreous coming forward. So I cleaned that up through the part plane, uh, removed the viscoelastic, and the case was completed. Um, day one, you know, especially these eyes that have vitrectomized, they look almost ghostly quiet. This eye looks very, very quiet. The lens is stable. Um, she had a, a good refractive outcome. Um, let me move back and show you. Uh, this is, um, bear with me. This is uh, a video of uh, the dilated exam at a week out. You can see the lens bag complex is very stable. The lens is on the right axis and the eye is very quiet. Uh, so in this case, uh, I, I thought it was a nice case to demonstrate that you can actually take the whole lens bag complex when you have a dislocated lens like this and put it on any axis you want and then go ahead and lasso it. Um, now, I'm, the I'm next- wondering you, I'm wondering if I could just quickly, just want to get uh, some, the retina opinion here. Uh, so, so, I, I love what you did and I would completely have used it and rotate the lens in the position and do exactly what you did. I'm curious though about the need to do vitrectomy. I find it's amazing how often we don't get vitreous prolapse, but uh, Jordy and others, I mean, I mean, what are your thoughts about in so, general doing this? So and also let me, let me kind of pull back a little bit and then go specific to the case, because I think the broader issue of lenses moving out of place, as somebody said, this is an epidemic. I agree with that. And and um, in, uh, it also the fact that this is not a surgery that was done 20 years ago, but this is a relatively recent surgery is something that I find particularly frustrating. You know, and and on our retina meetings, we have similar discussions. And and uh, the one thing we don't discuss is things like refraction and toric lenses because we forgot what toric and astigmatism is. But <laughs> but I think an issue here that's important is how bad is this dislocated? This this is a different case than the one that you presented the rabbi with the 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 lens complex completely gone down. We're going to get back to the rabbi later. Well, I I figured you would, so I'm yeah, going to yeah, hold yeah. up on that. Um, but but I think my biggest fear whenever I see anybody messing with with what you just did is what the vitreous is doing. You know, because you of course can move these lenses, and you've done a beautiful job at it, and and I congratulate you on that. And uh, but but my concern is. I think the vitreous is sometimes underappreciated by anterior segment surgeons. And it's, it's my belief that whenever possible, do the vitrectomy first uh, rather than later. I understand what you're trying to avoid. I understand that you're, that you're concerned that if you start doing vitrectomy, then the lens is going to move even more and you can have it in a harder Well, situation. in this case, though, there was no vitreous in the anterior chamber. So when I put viscoelastic in and I was rotating the lens, there was no vitreous there yet. They, now, they may not be any vitreous. you passing needles and stuff, then it's another story. So if you take a lens like this and you start doing a vitrectomy, uh, the lens is very likely to dislocate and fall backwards because you don't have anything supporting it at that point. It, it, from my end, that's usually what I will do. And, and I'm not worried if it goes back because I'll, I'll just deal with it. But, but, but my concern is, sure, you don't have vitreous in the anterior chamber, but you may have vitreous around areas that you're not seeing behind the iris. And as you start passing needles and moving things around, you, you may end up with a retinal detachment that you won't see in post-op day one or post-op month one, but you may see a few months down the road. I wonder what the other retina guys feel. Yeah, Steve, uh, John Randolph, great case. Um, I do a little bit of a, a kind of a combination of what you're both doing. So for the lasso technique, I, I like to lasso the one piece lenses in the bag like you've done so well first and then do my vitrectomy second. Um, I do agree with Jordy that you need to be, you know, aware of where the vitreous is, but 
I agree with with you, uh, Steve, that it's nice to have that little bit of cushion from the uh, anterior hyoid kind of holding that lens in place because trying to do a vitrectomy first and then bringing this back up to the anterior segment in a fully vitrectomized eye is tricky. Then you're kind of balancing the lens yeah. on the iris and it's very difficult to do. So I actually like to do what you did, use that cushion, position it, get a you know suture down and then do my full vitrectomy and make sure the peripheral retina looks good. I, I would just comment that I do pick a lot of lenses up off the retina. And whenever a yeah. lens is that severely dislocated, I just take it out. I don't bother trying to lasso it because I find the gymnastics involved in lassoing uh, more than just taking it out at that point. So if I, I agree, to where's your limit? I just take it out. Where's, well, where's Jordy, the, Jordy, the other thing you can do that I think is really nice is you can put iris hooks in the uh, anterior capsulotomy and stabilize that lens as well. That's another really nice way to stabilize. These but then you can't rotate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm I'm gonna move on to the next case because I got a bunch of cases I wanted to get you guys to uh, give me thoughts on. So this is a similar, go ahead. Just a question. Uh, when you do your lasso suture, uh, you do both of your entries, one in front of the other, instead of one next to the other to prevent yeah. some tilt. I yeah. think it's a very important point because if you do uh, one next to the other, you will cause some tilt of the lens and your astigmatism would be um, not corrected as you want. Yeah, I definitely, when I lasso, I always do radial uh, because uh, I don't want to get tilt. And I think that's a very important point. Um, also, if you'll notice, I took the blade and I made the blade, instead of in the groove, uh, I made a perpendicular to the groove, so I have a little bit more space in between to uh, hold the, uh, the suture in place. You know, the groove is only two millimeters long, from one and a half to three millimeters, three and a half millimeters posterior. And if you have two, groove, the two stab incisions made within the groove, you may only have a half a millimeter of tissue in between your sclerotomies. So by turning the blade horizontally, a perpendicular, to the radial groove, then you get a little more sclera in between the uh, two sclerotomies. The other, um, can I just say one thing, Steve, that the point that you made about not tying the suture too tight is really important in terms of astigmatism. So we have had a lot of induced um, astigmatism if we tie the radial suture too tight. So it's important to keep that in mind. Also, Steve, you cut the ends prior to burying. I like to bury and see that it's where I want it to be and then cut the ends because sometimes when you bury, it ends up off and you need to retie or refixate. All right, well, thank you, Nicole. I'm gonna go on to the next case because it's a similar type of case. There's an 85 year old with a dislocated lens bag complex. This lady clearly has pseudoexfoliation. She has an Alcon T4 toric correcting against the rule of stigmatism. And this is the axis the lens need to be sutured on to properly correct the astigmatism. But what is this? This is a, I'm sure you've seen these. This is a hyaline plaque with scleral thinning. And actually on OCT, there's very little sclera in this area. There's, uh, you can see the blue of the uvea poking through. So um, the question is, do we, what, what do we want to do for her? Because um, if I don't suture on this axis, it's going to be inducing more astigmatism. Uh, can I suture it over here? Uh, can I move it over a little bit and suture it? Um, should I use this lens or should I use, lose this lens? Uh, I mean, I think in this case, I would take down the conge and really kind of inspect and make sure we know what we're dealing with. Um, and if the sclera is too thin where you want to use it and lasso it, I would probably remove it and do a Yamani technique. And that way with the pseudo exfoliation, you can preserve uh, conjunctiva so our retina folks won't get mad at us um, and we can do a better job. Um, often also in pseudo exfoliation cases, they're going to have a pretty predominant uh, summerings ring. So it's important to uh, keep that in mind because if you lasso those people with a huge summerings ring, you can get an UGG syndrome. Yeah, and um, I, I was able to actually use OCT. I should have showed the OCT images to see just how much sclera there was here. And under this conjunctiva, where this thinning is over here, there's very little sclera. I mean, it's it's almost non-existent. This is really, really cheesy stuff over here. Um, that's why it has this indented look here and it's blue. This is an 85-year-old patient. Uh, I, I wonder, I, I worry about over manipulating these eyes on people that don't have a very long life expectancy in, you know, I'm curious what you think about that. Um, what do you mean by over manipulating? I mean, do you mean not fixing it? 
Well, no, I, I mean that I have a different perspective than you guys because I'm the guy that gets referred these cases after somebody has done two or three operations and, and the eye is a mess and the patient still can't see and then I have to fish something from the back well, of the eye. I just want to do one surgery. I don't want to send it to you. I want to take no, care I, of it. I, I'm <laughs> saying that obviously I'm at the bottle of the funnel or the end of the line. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let, me, let me give you my thought. What I did, I actually posted this on Karenet and to get some other doctors' thoughts about this, because initially I was going to just take it, maybe lasso it a little bit off access, maybe go over here or over here and, you know, whatever. And the feedback I got from my colleagues at Karen, especially Dean Awano, he said, Steve, I, I would stay the hell away from all of this stuff because there's a good chance you're going to get a melt if you put a Gore-Tex suture anywhere near this. You know, I, I would not touch this area. I would leave it alone. He said, I've seen... Uh, and other people echoed that, but I have a lot of faith in Dean. He's a very smart guy, and he sees these disaster anterior segment cases and has a lot of experience with that. So in this case, I did decide to, to lose the lens and just take it out and do Yamani. And so here's what this case looked like on the table. And so the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to start with my vitrectomy uh, to make the retina guys happy in this case. Uh, I put my ports in, and I stay away from that scleral thinning. I do a vitrectomy. And I'm gonna push the lens up as I do this. And then you can see this inferior haptic. Now, like most of these cases, they don't dilate very well. So I'm gonna have to kind of crab walk the lens up past this uh, small pupil, uh, get everything up into the anterior chamber. Now I'll do a real complete vitrectomy with the lens up here. When I cut these lenses in a vitrectomized eye, I cut 80 to 90% of the way through and then cartwheel the lens out. As I cartwheel it out, I protect the back of the cornea with the Sinsky hook so it won't hit the endothelium. I'm now going to inject the new lens, which is a Zeiss 602, and uh, go ahead and do Yamani with the 30 gauge needles. And I'm well away from the area of scleral thinning. Uh, this is the little melt. I, I don't like to use a big melt, just a little melt. Now I'm going to make an astigmatic cut on the steep axis to correct for astigmatism uh, and uh, do an iridotomy in the cases completed. And uh, this is what she looked like day one post-op. And again, you know, these eyes, when you do the pirate's plane of vitrectomy and Yamani and take everything out, they're, they're really kind of ghostly quiet. Here you can see the uh, astigmatic cut that I made. Uh, I did the, uh, she had a, it's four, a three and a half millimeter incision on the other side, clear cornea incision. And this pretty much did the job correcting her astigmatism. It's very easy to correct against the rule in much older patients. They tend to overcorrect if you're not careful. So, um, you know, she did quite well with that. She's about, I don't know, about six to eight months out now and she's doing just fine. Um, by the way, I would have done nearly the same thing. And that's what I meant to say by single operation because uh, I've seen people try to save these things and next you know it's a disaster. And I really loved how you, how you cleanly did it. Of course, I would have not done the, the, the limbo relaxing incision or send it to somebody That's the only else. way you get paid for these. <laughs> well, I, I need to start doing them then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so this is another technique that I've used to uh, fixate these dislocated lens bag complexes. This is a 6 so proline suture, and I'm going to melt it down and flatten the tip with a needle holder and create a little paddle. This is a 30-gauge needle, and I'm going to go through the capsule bag, feed the proline into that needle, and then pull that paddle out. And then do the same thing on the other side, 30 gauge needle piercing through. Uh, I'm gonna capture the uh, 6 proline suture, uh, feed it in and I get that little paddle. And these paddles on each side are gonna hold things in place. And then melt this down, tuck it into the scleral groove on each side, melt it down, tuck it into the scleral groove and then uh, close conge over it. And if you have a decent capsule of bag integrity, this is another technique that you can use. But to be honest, I, I think you have better control and better stability with Gore-Tex. So I tend to use that most of the time. Yeah, Steve, I just want to just make a comment. I, I agree with you. I think the control with the tension is always important. And I find that the the, the weakness here is if we don't tie tighten up or if it's too tight, the lens is decentered or, or you get some tearing of the capsule. So that's why I like the control. A couple of questions, Steve, that came up though. Um, number one, what about using tenoproline, somebody asked? And also, can you do this without opening the conjunctiva like a Hoffman pocket? What are your thoughts on those two questions? Well, a couple of things. Number one, um, you know, you have Gore-Tex and it's going to be much more robust and last a lot longer. I, I much prefer Gore-Tex for these because I think it's, uh, it's just much more robust and stable. Um, 
you know, the thing is that you don't have to tie it tight. You just you just want it enough so that it's it's replacing the zonules. You'd be surprised. You you don't even have to tie it at all when it holds things in place. But obviously, you have to do something with it. Now, the reason I don't like Hoffman pockets is that I want the knot to be buried in the eye. I don't want that knot under any sclera because that knot can erode through sclera. Uh, so I'm not a big Hoffman pocket fan with Gore-Tex. I know some people are. Uh, the other issue is that it's very hard to control the tension with a Hoffman pocket. Gore-Tex, I mean, you give a tiny little tug. I mean, just a tiny little tug. You just stare at it and the lens decenters three millimeters to that side. It's like, you have to be so careful working with it. And yeah. I think that it's, I can't control it through a Hoffman pocket. I'm just not capable of doing that. So mm -hmm. I, I prefer to make my little square of groove. I actually now, when I do the groove, I make a little, I undermine it on each side of the groove so that I can, you know, if it's a little loose, I can tuck that excess under, under that, oh, that shelf at the base of the scleral groove. And um, I mean, that works well for me, but it's not the only way to do it. It's just what works well for me. Yeah, I, you know, some people don't have access to Gore-Tex, you know, an academic center, you know, it actually says on the label, it's an off-label use and it says you do not put in the eye. Um, so in those cases, you know, they are stuck with using nino polypropylene, uh, tenno I probably wouldn't use, um, but we know that if you put polypropylene in an eyelet, it's going to rub and you have breakage over time. Uh, usually if it's lasted around something, it'll last, you know, a few years, probably about 10 years if it's done properly. Um, so those are the considerations uh, that I would make there. Okay, so I want, I want to keep you going along here because I know you have a couple of cases more. So let's- um... Oh yeah, yep, yep. Thank yep. you, Ike. Uh, this is a patient with a dislocated lens. And, and thank you for those comments. I agree with all of them. Well, this is a patient with a dislocated lens bag complex. And um, what, 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 what kind of lens is this, Nicole? Do you, can you figure that out? This is all I can see when I look at this patient. Um, I, I was able to do gonioscopy, but that's that right it's there. Like an the acreos. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. This is an acreos A060. So are we going to use it or lose it? Well, uh, you know, these lenses, um, we were fixating uh, back in 2010. 2015, um, and they center really nicely, this four-point fixation. The problem is, is they're hydrophilic acrylic and they can opacify over time. Um, so at this time, I don't know what year you were doing this, um, but you can try to, to fixate it um, if you can get a hold of the lens um, and use a pars plane, a basket suture to keep it in place while you're fixating it. Uh, otherwise, I would take it out. Um, Nicole, I, I agree with you completely. Uh, I, I chose to lose this lens and I lose all of these lenses um, because they do opacify. Uh, this is a patient, uh, this is a chief federal judge from Australia referred with a calcified acreos. Um, this is a, a patient from my own practice who had DSEC and an acreos done 10 years earlier that's calcified. And this is a calcified lens tech hydrophilic acrylic. This patient has been yagged and this patient has had no secondary surgery. They just developed this calcification and then somebody tried to yag it. So all hydrophilic acrylics, as I took this one out, this is day one post-op, and this is what the lens looks like uh, compared to the slit lamp photo. All hydrophilic acrylics can calcify, particularly uh, when a secondary procedure is done. And I learned this uh, the hard way. This is a phaco trabeculectomy that I did with mitomycin C in 2008 for pseudoexfoliation syndrome, uh, and now presents with a dislocated acreos lens, uh, a diffuse, beautiful filtering bleb, the pressure's 10 on no meds. So I said, well, we're gonna try to preserve this bleb and uh, you know, lasso this lens. So this was uh, something I did back in 2015. Uh, the bleb you can see on the right side over here. And um, I'm using the Gore-Tex on its own needle, which I bent into a curve. I'm gonna go through the eyelet, pass it back through the paracentesis, uh, and then take a 27 gauge needle and capture it. Uh, and lasso this side. And you can see, I'm gonna pull this down and that's gonna secure this side. And then the same thing on the other side. Um, now you can see, I haven't touched the conjunctiva near the bleb. I'm gonna pass through this eyelet here, grab this needle, turn it around, feed it back in, and I'm gonna use the, um, 
uh, the micro grasper, like a little uh, needle holder, and push that into the needle as I pull it out. I tie both sides, adjust the tension, rotate the knots in the squirrel groove, close conge. I did do a vitrectomy here to clean that up. And um, the patient was stable for two years of 2020 vision and a pressure 10, did great. Except uh, in 2017, two years later, he comes in with a complaint of decreased vision and it's down to 2070. And now it looks like that. So Nicole, what is that? Well, we have um, some opacification there. Yeah, so <clears throat> this lens is calcified now. Um, maybe it would have calcified anyway. Maybe it was because I went in there and did something. Uh, but now it's calcified and I've got this functioning filtering bleb. And if you look at this picture, you can see this nice juicy conjunctiva here. <clears throat> that bleb tracks around uh, on both sides pretty, pretty far. Um, so now what do I do? Do I tell him, sorry, tough luck? Do I tell him we can't go to the well it. anymore? Well, you gotta lose it. You gotta lose it, yeah. You gotta take it out, man, he's not happy. So how, what are you gonna do for this? What, what, how are we gonna take this thing out? Where are we gonna operate? What are we gonna do? So uh, I've been down this road um, and you know what I found is trying to take down the conjure, doing it externally and trying to pull and then you, you can pull the knot through uh, the ciliary body causing a cleft. Um, so I try and go internally um, and I just leave the Gore-Tex where it needs to be. And then I would take it out and do uh, a Yamani intraskeletal haptic fixation and preserve the con whatever conjunctiva I can have. Yeah, um, let me show you, because I, I, I agree with you. I, I start by putting my ports in for a vitrectomy <clears throat> and now I'm just gonna cut the suture. And after you cut it, you can just pull it out and just grab right. it and pull it out. I'm gonna crab walk the lens I cut it on both sides, crap work the lens, cut it in half and uh, pull it out. You gotta be very careful to get all the summerings ring stuff. And you can do Yamani right through a filtering bleb. It has no effect on the bleb basically. A bleb is not a blister. An established blend is like a sponge. And uh, if you can cut these blebs and you can stick a, a needle through them and they're not gonna leak. So I did Yamani right through the bleb. I finished the vitrectomy uh, and this is what he looked like uh, day one. This was back in 2017. So I did this a couple of years ago, three years ago now. And he's been, he's been doing just fine. His pressure's fine, his vision's good. Uh, so the bleb was maintained here because I didn't go anywhere near it really. Steve, um, so yeah. I a, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, yeah, you can do it through a bleb. The problem is when you get chemosis and you're trying to titrate your scleral tunnels of the needle symmetrically, it can be very difficult. Um, so you really have to use the feeling and the tension of the sclera as you pierce through the conjunctiva to understand where you are. And I think if you're going to do something like this, it should be with someone who's experienced with intraskeletal haptic fixation. Because if you don't and you enter too prematurely on one end versus the other, you're going to have tilt and asymmetry of the, of the IOL fixation. You know, and that's a good point. If you look here at where I um, made my uh, needle entry, I'll go back here. You can see I'm not going right through the bleb. I'm right at the periphery, as far in the periphery as I can go. And what I did was I actually used OCT to look at the scleral thickness because where the trabeculectomy flap is, you often are missing sclera, it's a little thin. So I knew I had good sclera here and I have a pretty good feel for doing these Yamani things. This was one of my earlier cases because this was back in 2017. But um, I, you're absolutely right. Um, but this, this lens, he ended up with a pretty plain R. You can see it's sitting pretty nice, pretty plain R and well centered here. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, Yamani is uh, that most of the patients who need it don't have pupils that dilate very well, which is good because the optic of the uh, lens is only about five millimeters uh, from a functional standpoint. So six millimeter optic, but a carrier ring that makes it really more of a five millimeter optic. What, what lens do you prefer for your Yamanis? Uh, CT Lucia, Zeiss CT Lucia 602. And I, I like that lens because it has polyvanillidine fluoride haptics, which are uh, almost indestructible. They have a uh, very good memory. You can bend the heck out of them. And they also, when you melt, melt into something that looks more like a mushroom than a light bulb or, uh, yeah, like a light bulb. So it's a different kind of melt and it's very easy to control. So the reason I show you that preceding case is that I had learned my lesson. And so when I see a patient like this, um, I always lose it. And in this case, I took it out, did Yamani, 
And this is day one after the lens exchange. Uh, again, the eyes are very, very quiet. Um, this is a little blue uh, terminal bulb in this case. It's very quiet in that area. You hardly even see anything. And again, I like to make a very small melt so I can get it into the tip of the tunnel to cap the tunnel. Um, that's the other side. You know, often if I'm not going through a bleb, um, I'm going to take the cons down like a little buttonhole. And I really want to see that that mushroom cap is in the sclera. So um, I think it's it's really important. We don't want these things subconjunctival. Yeah, I, I, I think it is important. You don't, you know, if you make a really big mushroom uh, melt, uh, it'll sit on the surface and you really don't want that. You want it embedded within the uh, tip of the tunnel. I'd so, like make, um, I, I have sorry, a different, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'd like to make one point that not all blebs are created equal. So, you know, if you have a, you know, a semi-vascular bleb, um, I have no experience with, with your technique, but as a glaucoma specialist, uh, um, if you have a very vascular bleb, uh, I'd be worried about causing a chronic blood leak that could lead to a, a blood revision down the line. So well, you we know, do always... blood needlings with 27 gauge, 30, you know, this is just a 30 gauge needle and you're going through the periphery. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I have very little concern of creating a blood leak here, especially in an established blood that's 13 years old, you know, but, and anyway, I'm going to move on because uh, we still have quite a bit of material. Um, this is, um, you know, I, I've been working with the same scrub nurse for, for years. And she's been watching me doing these cases. And she said, you know, I, Steve, I have a uncle and he's been treated for 18 years down in Philly, uh, the retina service, the glaucoma service down at Wills. And, you know, he, he's not doing well. Could you take a look at him? I said, yeah, I mean, if he's willing to come up from Philly to Lawrenceville, I'll take a look at him. So this is a 72 year old uncle of my scrub nurse. This is his left eye. He had cataract surgery 18 years earlier. He had count fingers vision. He has chronic uveitis with glaucoma and chronic CME since then. And you can see he's got loss of the ellipsoid zone here, chronic CME. His TRAB was done 10 years earlier. His pressure is three with decimase folds when I see him. He has six diopters against the rule stigmatism. Uh, Justine's my scrub nurse name. I say, you know, Justine, your uncle's eye is probably pre I I don't think it's worth operating on. I'm, I'm, I, I really don't want to operate on this eye. I don't think there's much pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. You know what I will do though, I'll take him off his, uh, his uh, COSOP and uh, I'll give him some steroids. I don't know why he's on COSOP with the pressure three. I'll see if I can quiet it down. So I stopped his glaucoma med, started aggressive steroids and he comes in a month later with a pressure of 11. The cornea looks clear, but the lens bag complex is now sitting on the retina. And he says, doc, this lens moving around in my eyes driving me nuts. Can you do anything about it? So at that point, I said, well, you know, the cornea looks better. Let, let's remove it. Let's take it out. Uh, you know, I don't think we have much to lose. The thing is that this guy doesn't dilate at all. So I don't really have a good view. I don't know what's going on. But I said, let's go ahead and take it out. So in this case, I made a temporal scleral tunnel because he had six diopters against the rule. And said I, I would take everything out in one piece to try to correct some of his astigmatism. So here he is at the beginning of the case. I put iris hooks in. I made a temporal scleral tunnel. I did a vitrectomy. Uh, and now I'm bringing the lens bag complex up. And when I bring this up, I want you to see what the summering's ring looks like. I mean, this thing looks like a placenta. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at this. So, I, I mean, I wasn't really prepared for this. So I'm trying to get this out through this scleral tunnel incision. And this is some of the nastiest, blackest, thickest stuff uh, I've ever seen. So I'm, I'm trying to basically use my infusion line to burp some of this stuff out. But a big hunk of this ends up on the retina. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go back there and I'm gonna see if I can crush this into my vitrectomy tip. But it's, it's absolutely impossible. This thing is rock hard and the vitrector is not doing anything. I have a phaco uh, frag, uh, you know, vid frag mode uh, on the vitrector and it's not doing a damn thing. So I said, okay, let me bring this up into the anterior chamber where I'm a little bit more comfortable with it. So I'll kind of crab walk it up past the iris and maybe I can take it out through the scleral tunnel. And I tried that for five or 10 minutes and it didn't work. So what I did was I took the fragmentome, put it on a hundred and just fake a fragment of this. And this is severely edited. This took about, I don't know, about six or seven minutes to fake a fragment this with the, with the fragmentome. 
And finally, I fragmented this and uh, went ahead and did Yamani here. And at this point, you know, Justine, my scrub nurse's niece, is actually scrubbing on the case with me. And I'm like, Justine, I don't, I don't think this eye is going to do too well, man. We're beating it up pretty good. I, you know, she goes, yeah, you know, I mean, we both said WTF about 15 times during this case. But I, I went ahead and did Yamani. And uh, what's amazing is one week post-op, he was 2060 uncorrected. You see the cornea looks pretty good. The lens is in good position, but this is what his retina looked like beforehand. And this is what the retina looked like one week post-op. The CME resolved, 18 years of CME, steroids, glaucoma, all of that stuff went away when I took out this uh, summering's ring from hell. So the reason I wanted to show this particular case is that I, I, I don't think anybody considered the possibility that that Summering's ring could basically be uh, causing a chronic uh, uveitic picture. Uh, and I don't think it's something that we often do think about, but uh, from doing these cases, I, I've learned that um, these giant Summering's rings can be very uh, pro-inflammatory. And when you remove these, the patients uh, do much better. So uh, a patient like this, this is a banker referred for lasso of the lens, sent to me specifically for that. I do not lasso something like this. I lose it and I take it out. And this is day one after your money on a pirate's plane of atrectomy. Um, so are there any comments uh, about that case? Yes, I, I've had to deal with multiple of these, of these cases. <clears throat> and usually of course, when they sent to me, the lens is already, the complex is already in the back of the eye. And when I look at these summering, summering ranks, because I've messed with them for way too darn long, and you feel like you're just banging your head against the wall, not making any progress. And, and so at this point, I've just completely changed my approach because I, I feel that I'm happy that your case did really well, but I've seen situations that don't do that well. And so what I do is I do a large incision in the cornea and I just pull the whole complex out as a single piece. And, and, and like if I was doing- Well, I did have a large incision here. I had a six yeah. millimeter square tunnel yeah. here, but well, I just Steve, couldn't I, get it out. Yeah, but, Steve, but, I, but yeah. I was gonna say, uh, Nicole, it says, I just don't mess with it to begin with. So I have the whole complex, bring it forward and pull the whole complex out as a single piece and then deal with the lens. But that's no. what I did. I, I did pull it out as a single piece. If you I go mean, back- The whole and, complex together with the right. lens and everything. Yeah, some right. of it fell. Some of it fell back. But Steve, I would put a sheet slide underneath and raise my infusion, and they they typically will burp out if it can't fall back. If you just you know push down on the posterior lip, well, it will come out. they typically will pull burp out. But this one wasn't typical. If you look at the size of this thing, well, it was a brunescent summerings. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> black. I mean, the whole yeah. thing was black, and, um, and even I mean, this is gigantic. I mean, really, just yeah. gigantic. You so, know. Steve, I, you know, I just want to say, I, I know, I'm sorry about the time, but I, I'm really glad you presented this case because, you know, the chronic pseudophagodenesis and the chronic damage that was happening in this eye because of the lack of referral um, is critical to point out. And this patient would not have the comorbidities if somebody would have referred the patient earlier. Um, so seeing pseudophagodenesis, but it's not out of the visual axis, is not a reason to just watch and sit on an eye while it stays inflamed and causes glaucoma. Yeah, and you know because this patient didn't dilate well with the lens jiggling around the way he looked initially. If you go back and look at the way he presented to me, um, you know this is as much as he dilated. Right. You know if you look here, let me go back. Well, Steve, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you just finished up in one minute. This this is like this is like when Steve Saffron calls me on the phone. I'm in the OR. It ends up being like a 30 minute call. Which is great. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I yeah, but make, this, the, yeah, go I'm ahead, get, please. I'm going to wrap up though, Steve. Okay. All because right. So let fine. me go, go to the last uh, case here. And it's been um, great. It's been fantastic to hear the discussion and the different perspectives. Okay. So this is, uh, what about our rabbi? It's a delicate diaphanous capsular bag. The pupil doesn't dilate well. Um, he has a history of uveitis. Essentially, a monocular patient who can't afford downtime. He has glaucoma. And a vitrectomy is unavoidable no matter what I do. With a patient lying flat, the lens sits back into the anterior mid vitreous. So, what do we do for him? Do we use it or do we lose it? Well, if there's no sulcus support of an anterior capsule, which it looks like there's not, then you lose it. Um, lassoing three pieces, um, you know, sometimes they slip off. 
Suturing this to the iris could cause more chronic inflammation, but this patient needs to be pre-treated with steroids, um, you know, a week prior oral steroid and topical uh, to uh, prevent more inflammation post-operatively. And uh, I agree with those points. And I think that they're important. I think that um, th there's a reason I wanted to show this case. In this case, I actually did both. I used it and lost it. Um, so uh, first I'm gonna bring the lens forward a little bit by burping it, a little fluid out because the lens was sitting pretty far back. I start by putting patrol cars in and uh, clean up the vitreous. Uh, now I'm gonna pass my, because in this case there was vitreous prolapse. And you're gonna see, I'm gonna pass my first needle through the capsule of bag here. But this uh, capsule of bag, this is a dead bag. It's a very uh, diaphanous, uh, uh, there's not much there. Uh, it's very uh, tenuous, thin tissue. There's no fibrosis at all. You can see that. So I'm passing this through here and it's really the fibrosis that secures the suture on the haptic. But nevertheless, I'm gonna go ahead and lasso both sides and tuck this in the sclera. And right now this looks pretty good. Um, I feel pretty good about this. I'm just gonna give a little nudge test that make sure it's secure. And uh, it looks, well, you know, I'm gonna get out of here while we're getting good, I think, you know? So I'm gonna come out of here and um, yeah. So is. the lens falls back. Now I just happen to get a little lucky here and uh, sweep with my Sinsky hook and it's like, look what I found. And I actually don't have a haptic. I've actually snagged the peripheral anterior cap, the capsule of bag here. So it's sort of spinning on that. Uh, now I'm gonna grab this, uh, make sure I really grab because if I don't grab it securely, I'm just gonna end up dropping it in the back of the eye. And now I've, I think Nicole was right. Now I think it's time to just go ahead and lose this. So I'm gonna bring this up into the anterior segment, cut it in half, cartwheel it out, make sure I get all the summerings ring stuff out. Um, go ahead and do your money, um, close up all my incisions. And in this case, uh, I will have to fix the iris because um, you know there was an iris suture there. So I'll go ahead and close that down and um, make a peripheral iridotomy. And um, this is what he looked like uh, one month post-op. He did very well. Um, so uh, I think I, I showed you some Iowa lasso knots and some knots. Um, so I don't know if there are any comments on that case, but, uh, well, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, we're, we're going to move forward. I'm just going to get Jeb maybe to put a transition slide in there. So, uh, it was great. I mean, I think these are the kind of things where there's a lot of different perspectives and we do have to be very, very cognizant of the retina, of course, and also glaucoma. And I think surgical technique and respecting vitreous is important. Uh, we, we have, we have a slide for you here, Steve, a new, a new, uh, cover slide for you, uh, as the cowboy, yeah, <laughs> a cowboy here. Um, and the only thing I would add to the comments that have been made, and people have answered them well, is that you know in Canada we're fortunate we have access to the iris claw lens, which actually is a very straightforward lens, and you know we can put it put onto the iris as one other option as well. Uh, and for those of you that asked as well, an ACI well can be used in certain situations. I'm not a big fan of them, but I think you know an older patient is fine. So let's move let's move forward though, and I want to make sure we get uh, Jordy in here. And thank you, Jordy, for being here. Last time I saw Jordy was the last meeting I attended, which was in Barranquilla, Colombia. We, we just got out in time before uh, Corona hit everywhere. And, um, and, and so it was great to meet you there, Jordy, and thank you for being here. If you want to, if you want to share your screen. Anytime. Where do, I, where do I put share the screen? I'm looking uh, for I see it there. There's a I green button. Just push it, and you'll basically kick off uh, Jeb's slide there. Absolutely. We've got had, it. We've had, you know, our attendance is we've had about over 400 people here. We've had a couple hundred people on YouTube. So it's been amazing seeing That's that really good people here. And, and I want to appreciate your comments in the first two cases. You're always very thoughtful uh, and always progressive. So let's hear a bit about uh, your perspective on cataract. Before I start, I want to bring up something from Steve. Uh, that cystic macular edema that disappeared that quickly in your case, I doubt that it was inflammatory, even if it may have a component of inflammation from the pseudophagodonesis. I think it was mostly hypotenus. Uh, because you don't usually have such a sudden improvement in a cystoid, chronic cystoid macular edema. Um, so what you did was you fixed the hypotony also in the process. And I think that was a, a, a good... Well, the patient's hypotony was better uh, when I used the steroids to stop the glaucoma meds, but he still had CMA. The CME uh, under, didn't improve understood. until uh, I took the lens out. I'm saying you, I'm saying you have a combination of, of it's a multifactorial cystoid macular edema and, and hypotony is always really bad. Uh, and I want to just, before I say, before I start, I just want to make sure that everybody that's in here helps me 
try to convince um, convince um, industry that we need some other form of lens implantation for uh, for no bag support cases. Uh, industry feels that we don't need it because there's no there's no market, and I think the market is obviously growing, and and we're all trying to come up with our own little certain techniques. But I think it would be nice to have something that's more kind of planned for this uh, from the from the moment you open up the box. So I, my my presentation is very simple and and not too complicated, uh, but I just want to kind of go back to the basics of what happens after vitrectomy surgery and, and think about cataract from that end. Uh, and I'm trying to go a little bit fast uh, uh, just to get to the points. Basically, not every posterior uh, post vitrectomy cataract is the same and there's different forms of cataracts that we need to consider. Uh, so the first one uh, that we need to always think about, and this is what we see, the anterior segment people don't tend to see it, is what we call the gas desiccation cataract. That happens when we do a vitrectomy and uh, we fill the eye with a, with a bubble of either gas or air. And since the lens uh, is not vascular, it's not a vascular structure, <clears throat> basically the oxygen and metabolites that feed the, the lens fibers, the, the lens cells are coming from the aqueous. And remember that the, the vitreous is aqueous plus some proteins and glycosaminoglycans. So it's still the aqueous that's feeding, that's feeding the lens. So whenever you put a gas bowl behind a lens, that may stop the flow of metabolites and oxygen. And you'll have this typical cataract, we call it a gas ca cataract. It has this sort of fern-like appearance. <clears throat> and the management of it is, is to put the bubble out of the lens. Uh, so in this patient, as you see on the presentation there and to the right, and, uh, so we just had the patient be face down for like 48 hours and then the lens became completely clear. If this, um, if this stays for a little bit longer, you'll have a typical PSE cataract. Um, that, that you guys are used to seeing. So the second thing that you have to consider whenever you talk about um, post vitrectomy cataracts, and this is one of my pet peeves, is what I call the posterior capsular defect cataract. You know, whenever you do vitrectomy, one of your main goals is to not hit the lens. But anybody that tells you, any cataract, any retina surgeon that tells you that they haven't messed the lens in their lives is, is not lying is lying or not making enough surges. So there's different ways that you can hurt the lens from the back. And this is the most significant one is when you create a posterior capsular defect. For example, this here, what you're seeing is a, a standard, a standard uh, lens probe, uh, I mean, sorry, laser probe. That's a curved laser probe to reach the anterior, the anterior areas of the retina. If you're not careful, that tip of the, of the laser probe can rake through the posterior lens capsule and cause a pretty significant capsular tear. Another way to do so is literally use a vitrectomy uh, port and, and eat a uh, posterior lens capsule. Now, these, these type of cataracts are very typical in the sense that they progress very rapidly after vitrectomy and oftentimes to a white mature cataract. And um, I personally, as a retina guy, if I ever do that and I always have fellows to blame them <laughs> is I don't like sending this to my anterior segment colleagues because I feel that I'm doing a disservice. But I've received way too many calls in my career where, where a cataract guy calls me and says, hey, listen, I had this case and he had a vitrectomy. And then a couple of weeks later, he had a white cataract and I'm about to like stop him to say, please stop right there. And then the conversation goes into, so then I did a FACO and it usually goes this way. They do a capsular rexus and they do the hydro dissection and some were very close short after that, boom, the whole lens goes into the back of the eye. Uh, so the point here is recognition that a posterior capsular tear can occur in a rapid progression to a white cataract has to always be considered. So as a retina guy, what I do is I'll bring the patient to vitrectomy, I'll do a posterior lensectomy, leave a, an anterior sulcus rim where I can put a nice easy place uh, uh, sulcus uh, lens implant um, but if you're going to do an anterior approach, then, then what you have to do is avoid full hydro dissection so that you don't open up that bag and do the opposite, which is just only hydro delineation uh, with a very careful uh, procedure. And I know Ike has done some of those cases and he shows them and, and, but you have to be very careful. I think the most important part is have the, always be thinking of the possibility that somebody tore the posterior lens capsule uh, in, in their surgeries. 
Um, another type of posterior uh, type of uh, cataract, and this is not the best cataract to, to, to demonstrate, but I wanted to point is that when you're doing a vitrectomy, particularly with your two ports, the two supertemporal and infratemporal ports, you can sometimes hit the lens without actually causing a posterior lens defect. And usually what that'll happen is with the, with the, the shaft of your vitrectomy instrument, for example, or your light pipe, you may basically hit the posterior lens and usually you'll notice a PSC cataract that is in this direction, in this direction yeah. over here, okay? And then the important thing is sometimes these PSC cataracts don't progress to have the, to, to hit the posterior lens, the, the visual axis, I'm sorry. You may have that sort of like linear cataract over there that you can leave uh, and avoid. But I think the important part is for the cataract surgeons to recognize when you have a post vitrectomy eye with the linear PSC cataract in this sort of oblique configuration to consider the possibility that it was uh, trauma and surgery. The most other typical cataract after cataract after vitrectomy surgery is nuclear sclerosis. And nuclear sclerosis, what it really is, it's an oxidation of the lens fibers. And uh, the vitreous has um, a component of, of ascorbic acid, vitamin C, which everybody's now uh, try to buy vitamin C on target and it's, it's completely sold out because of coronavirus. But vitamin C, what it does is it's an oxygen sink. So the natural vitreous is actually decreasing the oxygenation of the lens fibers. But when you remove it, you actually increase the oxygen tension inside the vitreous cavity and you effectively facilitate or, or speed up the process of nucleosclerosis progression, usually six, in, six to 18 months. And this is the one that you guys are most used to seeing uh, after vitrectomy surgery. So a couple of things about phaco post vitrectomy. First of all, yes, it's gonna be a deeper chamber uh, and you have to assume that the vitreous guy may have done some damage to the sonules, particularly when they're doing you know, aggressive anterior vitrectomy and when they're clearing the vitreous skirt. Uh, you know, we try to avoid that, but it'll, it'll happen. Uh, another one that's very important to think about is the silicone oral cataract. So silicone oil, um, as you all know, is uh, something that we try to remove on most of our patients, but there are situations either because the patient needs it, that you have to leave the oil in place for longer than, than, than a few months, or a patient basically leaves uh, and comes back a few years later. And you have, this is a typical silicone oil cataract. The silicone oil cataract, uh, let, let's, let's talk about this because this is kind of interesting for me. First of all, I here have a vinaigrette for you guys to remember that silicone oil floats above the vinegar. So in essence, realize that the, the, the physics of the oil is such that it's gonna be literally putting positive pressure on your posterior lens capsule. Um, if you are doing these surgeries, uh, an anterior segment approach to these surgeries, first of all, you need to expect small bubbles of oil to migrate through the zonules and that'll happen during the surgery. And the best approach for that is to really worry about them and keep on your procedure because the, they'll, they'll be absorbed by your, by your instruments. But from a cataract surgeon perspective, what I would recommend you guys do is a very tight wound with a very good construction because if you have leak uh, of, of fluid through your wound, then you will have this positive pressure bothering you over time. So I would just say, be very careful with a good wound construction, elevate the infusion pressure so that you're basically inflating the anterior segment to kind of fight that oil that's coming forward. A bigger problem happens when a posterior, a significant capsular tear, posterior tear happens during the cataract surgery, because then you have true bubbles of oil migrating into the anterior chamber, oftentimes with lens fragments still in place. That is a, a legitimate disaster in my opinion. And usually the best approach is to avoid getting to that point. But if you get to that point, then uh, there's different things to ways to handle it. Um, oftentimes we need to get involved, the, the, the retina guys. The simplest approach from our end is to basically do a trick and remove the oil, then remove the lens fragments because it's very difficult to remove the lens fragments when they're surrounded by oil uh, and then deal with the situation. Now, there's a, a condition that I want to talk about that, hold a second, let me go back in here, that, that you may or may not see often, and I'm not sure if I have a, uh, an image of this, which is the what I call the... I call it the, the trapdoor effect of silicone oil into the anterior segment. The best case scenario with an oil-filled eye is to have a good diaphragm between the vitreous cavity and the anterior segment. And that'll happen with a normal natural lens 
or it'll happen with a well-placed in the bag IOL. The moment that you have a torn capsule and you have sulcus IOLs or sutured IOLs or AC IOLs, that is a compromise of that diaphragm. Oil will start coming forward through these holes. When you have a sulcus IOL, it'll create this trapdoor effect where oil comes forward and the lens goes back and the, you end up having these bubbles of oil in the interior segment that will not return to the back part of the eye. And against the, the better judgment of most of my anterior segment colleagues, the best approach to handle this is actually to remove the IOL and leave the patient aphakic. And the reason for that, it's a little counterintuitive because you're saying you're taking this, diaph this, this, this platform off. And I'm saying, yes, you are, so that the interior segment bubbles can migrate to the back and then deal with what's happened later. That's not necessarily a permanent sort of situation. So remember, as I said, this MRI, this eye here is filled with oil and you're seeing that oil bubble as it, as it floats up. But one of the problems that happens with the silicone oil cataracts is that what matters is really not the cataract, it's the fact that there's retinal pathology behind and the cataract is not allowing us to determine what's happening in the back. You cannot do an ultrasound with silicone oil. Yes, you can do an MRI, but it won't give you as much information as you wanna to know to determine how the heck are you gonna handle this? So you have to remove this cataract and improve the visual axis, not just simply to improve the view, but also so that you can determine what the heck you're gonna do with the retina. Another issue here is silicone oil emulsification. I'm sorry, I'm making, having my coffee, my espresso, because I'm still half asleep. Mm. So silicone emulsifications, you can see, uh, it's not as obvious as this patient. A uh, bunch of glaucoma guys here, and I will tell you that if it, you probably can agree with me, then you have a chronic silicone oil patient or someone that's had silicone oil in the past and oil was removed. When you do a gonioscopy, you will find little bubbles of oil at the 12 o'clock uh, angle. And, and if the pressure is elevated, that has a lot to do with that. Um, obviously, you have these patients that present like this into the clinic. And just like uh, Dr. Safran was talking about leaving the, putting the patient back to see what the IOL does, recognize that if there's little bubbles in the interior segment, then even if you don't see them that much when the patient's at the slit lamp, the moment that patient lays supine, those bubbles are gonna come to the dome of the cornea and, and you're gonna have to deal with them in surgery. Now, you can have these situations as well. Uh, that actually is a silicone oil filled eye with 100% silicone oil emulsification in the interior chamber. Um, how to approach these cases is very difficult. What I usually do is, first of all, recognize that the problem is not the interior segment. Even though the interior segment is the obvious thing, you have to remove the oil from behind the interior segment. Because otherwise, I always think about this as the, like the magician that's pulling on, on, on the handkerchiefs. So you clear the interior chamber, it's just gonna refill from what's happening behind it. So you have to take the oil out from behind, then clear the interior chamber, then deal with what's, what's, what's left in there. What about uh, a, a different perspective? Uh, posterior capsular opacities and silicone oil filled eyes. First of all, this PCO that you see looks very standard PCO. What's interesting about this, this is a post of day one surgery. So this patient, I had to do the FACO. I'm, I'm one of the rare uh, retina guys in the United States that still does some FACOs. I don't do refractive or yeah, I just do, I just try to clean up my own disasters basically. Um, so this patient had cataract surgery uh, and at the end of the cataract surgery, you see this big plaque that's present from the chronic silicone oil, the eyes filled with oil. Again, the concept here is we don't know if we can remove the oil yet because we could not see into the back of the eye from the white cataract. So the plan here is approach the interior segment, take the cataract out. So now we can look at the posterior segment and say, okay, what are we gonna handle with this? I'm gonna take the oil out, how's the retina? Is there some inferior retinal attachment? But on post of day one, there's a fibrotic capsule. Uh, I will tell you, it's nearly useless to try to polish this intraoperatively because it's not your standard sort of remnants. It's the actual capsule. Uh, and the second thing is that if you try to polish this and you cause a, a rent, uh, then you're, as I said, you're going to be in, in a world of hurt with oil bubbles coming to the front. So the best approach for me is to say, leave it in place and deal with it, uh, leave the capsule to, to be fixed. So how do we deal with the posterior lens capsule? Uh, um, so for example, this patient is a nice patient of mine that had an intraocular foreign body uh, years ago at a bat rental attachment and had the same process. You know, we silicone oil, 
ended up having a cataract, uh, lens was placed, and this patient was lost to follow-up for about three years and shows back up with this, you know, 10 plus, 10 cross uh, posterior capsular opacity. So it used to be said that these capsular opacities could not be cleaned with a YAG laser, and that's not true. You can actually clean them with a YAG laser, but it does require certain little tricks here. First of all, understand that the oil is dampening this acoustic wave. So the YAG laser, what it does is a photoacoustic that creates these little tiny bubbles from, from, uh, from what's sort of sublimation and uh, allows you to have these ripple effects of, of, of waves that go through a capsule that tear the capsule. When the oil is behind it, I always think of it as like a drum that you put in your, your hand on the drum head, it's not sounding. So the same thing here, it's dampening of this, of this capsule. So if you're gonna do a gag laser, I call it the sculpture technique. Basically, by the way, this is a, a, an image taken from the YAG laser slit lamp. I grabbed my iPhone as I did the YAG and I took a photo through the, through the YAG machine. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make is you have to go literally one point here, one point here, one point here, one point here, very, very delicately. It's like a, like a sculpture doing, doing tiny little bits. But the other thing that's interesting is that you finish this circular break in the posterior lens capsule, that plaque is still stuck behind the lens. It's not that your standard cataract patient that, the, that it floats back. The silicone oil is making it stay ahead, stuck against the posterior lens capsule. So the way to handle that is you need to create a, a little edge on that, on that capsule. So if you see here, that little bubble, you see that bubble right there? That's an intentional bubble. I did a, a few little spots of YAG with a decreased power at the edge of the capsule so that a bubble will create that little lift. And the lift is gonna do this over the course of the next week or two. So most of these patients you don't have to take to surgery, you just have to know how to do a YAG laser for. Now, uh, we've been talking a bit about bad lenses and, and IOLs, and I'm not gonna talk about it right now, but the, the point from the previous uh, cases is look at the interior segment, look for the vitreous, look for the vitreous going to the wounds. This is a post of day one cataract surgery from one of my friends, and enough unfortunately taking care of way too many lenses in the vitreous cavity on the first week after surgery. Um, and, and the point here is to remember that, that the vitreous is not just something sitting there, that the vitreous, particularly the anterior vitreous, is attached to, to the vitreous base, and the vitreous base is attached to the retina. And uh, if you pull it and you create issues, you will uh, cause retinal tears. Um, I was going to make some points about uveated cataract, but maybe uh, maybe we can leave that for some other talk uh, for the for the benefit of time. Uh, but one of the things that I do want to point out here, uh, with a bunch of cataract people uh, and anterior segment people is that it is true that you can handle a, 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 a cataract on a uveitic patient, very straightforward. I think the first case that was presented had uh, some degree of uveitis. I think Richard presented it uh, with great results. My perspective as a retina guy is to always, always beware of the patient with severe vitritis and panuveitis. It's oftentimes uh, mis, uh, mis not expected by the interior segment guys. And then what they end up doing is they do a standard FACO, they put the lens in the bag, and then eventually they send the patient back to me a few months later with a cyclitic membrane and a complete disaster. And, and so the point I'm making is, if you have anterior uveitis, by all means, do your cataract and approach like you always do. But when you have a severe, severe panuveitic patient, sometimes these patients are best handled with insectomy and aphakia. Uh, basically, um, these are not patients that the refractive outcome is gonna be the bigger issue. What you're trying to do is save the eye. Uh, and the issue is determine which are the patients that, that are that severe versus the patients that just have a, you know, a little, for example, the first patient that Richard percent that definitely needed a FACO. Um, so, you know, uh, you guys know about how many small pupils. The other part that's important is, for example, here's an example of traumatic cataracts. This patient came to me and uh, the cataract surgeon was nice enough to not move to, to perform cataract surgery. Uh, what was happening with this patient? This patient was hammering metal on metal. Here you can see the, the corneal wound. Here, this is the anterior capsular uh, tear from, the, from something that went in there. But the issue here is, yes, there's a cataract, but there's more to it than that. That is the posterior lens capsule or opening once you, you, you kind of uh, focus behind it. And uh, yeah, you try to do a B scan and all those sort of things and you don't, you're not able necessarily to find the interactive foreign body. But the point I'm making in these situations is 
more than imaging, the important thing is the history. In a traumatic cataract, assume that there's compromise of the vitreous and you have to deal with that appropriately. So in this specific patient, the way I handle these situations, I go from the back, I do a vitrectomy, I do, just like I mentioned earlier, I do a lensectomy, I open up the anterior lens capsule, and in this patient, I was able to remove the central intraocular foreign body. Literally, I grabbed it through, I put these forceps through the limbus, through the, through the aphakic pupil, grabbed the foreign body, pulled it out, and I left the patient aphakic until everything kind of healed up a little bit, and then we'll deal with the secondary IOL later. I always think that uh, aphakia is not, it, it's a curable condition. And in bad situations, it's okay to leave the patient aphakic uh, while you deal with the circumstances that are underlying and then make your de de determination how you're gonna handle the aphakia, what type of lenses you're gonna use, et cetera, et cetera, at a, at a later time. So the point here is, you know, you guys know this, sun and instability, vitreous and anterior chamber. Uh, in the anterior approach versus the posterior approach that I was just uh, commenting on. Now, it's interesting when, when we talk about these sort of the interplay between the phacos and the vitrectomy, there's a very significant differences in approaches between the United States and the non-United States people. And it's mostly related to how retina people in the United States usually don't do phacos, number one. Second, they're, they're penalized by the referring community if they start doing phacos basically that, that you, you have to maintain this sort of process. Um, uh, other sequential trips to the OR is much less difficult than, pace, than in locations with, with socialized medicine. Uh, I don't know about Canada, but I have a friend of mine that is in Montreal. He tells me I've got one trip to the OR. I'm gonna do a fecal vitrectomy for a, for a two plus an S with a macular hole. That doesn't usually happen in the United States because we're able to go back and forth in these surgeries. Um, so, if you're gonna do a posterior lensectomy, this is how I approach these things. I first perform a, a, a you know, small pyridomy. That's if I'm thinking that I'm gonna need a 25 or, now thankfully we have 23 gauge uh, uh, frags, uh, but when we had only 20 gauge uh, frags, I will do a little pyridomy at first to let that bleed and go forward. Do the vitrectomy as the view allows. Then do a central posterior capsulectomy with a vitreous cutter, right a little hole in there through which I can do a posterior hydrodissection with the 25 gauge needle on BSS. And the whole interest of mine here is to basically cleave that anterior lens capsule from the, uh, from the cortex, anterior cortex, so that I can do a proper lensectomy from the back, whether it's with a fragmentum or the cutter, uh, and then leave that anterior lens capsule. But here, this is the important part that I tell my, my, my retina colleagues. If you do this, you have to open a central hole in the, post in the anterior lens capsule. You do not leave an anterior lens capsule in an AFIC patient uh, without doing anything because two things will happen. 100% of these will opacify really quick. And number two, the anterior lens capsules will migrate forward and cause pupillary block. So do not do that. Leave a capsule that you can always put a secondary IOL later. Um, high myopia, again, you guys know about high myopia. This is my perspective of high myopia. Um, it, but I always say, you know, uh, think about the, think about, a fakia as a possibility because, for example, if you have a patient that needs a, you know, plus two IOL, uh, I would rather do vitrectomy lensectomy in these patients, particularly if they have bad bad pathology because the refractive guys can actually handle these these small power dioptric powers uh, with other techniques and intraocular lenses. Uh, but as I said, do not leave a fake a patient with intact features and capsule. That's that's always a bad idea. Uh, so for example, let me, let me uh, this is, should have been a video, but I just try to do a sequential sort of situation. And I brought a case that the anterior glaucoma guys would, would kind of feel some degree of, of, of recognition of this. So this is a patient that was referred to me from a glaucoma guy, uh, had trauma. And what you're seeing right here is the anterior placement of the lens. The lens has migrated anteriorly. Now you have an acute glaucoma attack from a subluxation of the, of the natural lens into the anterior segment, and the patient has pressure like 65. So how to handle this case? So um, unfortunately, I had to clear up some of that uh, anterior, uh, the, the, the epithelium of the cornea. I hate doing so, but I had to do it in this case. Um, create a little space, uh, basically do your, per, your, your paracentesis and inject some viscoelastic. This is the view intraoperatively, which is a horrific view from, and to try to do a vitrectomy through this is what you basically, what I call a proprioceptive vitrectomy. You don't see, you just know where your hands are. Um, but as you start moving forward, you start realizing 
that as you put disco elastic, you're realizing now better the, the sort of anatomy of that lens. And the lens capsule is completely torn. And uh, at the expense of my, my fellow anterior segment friends, I basically removed the majority of this lens capsule with the digital scutter because uh, it really wasn't doing much, particularly after it had been moved forward. Um, and at the end of the surgery, so this is a posterior lensectomy on a patient that has a lens in the front part of the eye. Even though the view is pretty hazy, I can see that the retina is, is normal and the peripheral retina is normal. And at the end of the surgery, this is what we have. Now, no retinal injury, but I'm always very careful and I try to avoid lens implantation on primary surgery on these patients. Uh, because in my opinion, there's too many variables that are still moving in this situation. And I don't really know what the final outcome is gonna be. This patient can redetach. This patient can create some situations and the problem. So I personally, this patient with a relatively clear cornea, uh, I would, I just basically leave like that. And then we watch him, see what happens in the next few months. Once the inflammation subsides and you can determine that the anatomy is gonna stay well, then I can say, okay, let's think about the lens implant. What lens implant we're gonna put and what's the situation. In trauma, we were talking about choroid earlier. In trauma, always worry, always worry about how, what the choroid is doing. So these are things that can do supracortal hemorrhages. These are cases in which if you're trying to do a scleral fixation, you know, the cord is thickened, uh, you may have a, a situation there. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to avoid this retinal complications after cataract or from cataract surgery. I have a, another lecture that I can give you guys uh, in the future for that. But I wanted to bring up a discussion since, since uh, you have a bunch of interior segment guys here. Let's see what you guys think about the thoughts. Thanks so much, Jordy. That was a really uh, great review on, on the retina aspect of the anterior segment work. I, I thought we would get maybe John Randolph as well as Eric, I think, here. John, it looks like you've taken off your tie or jacket. I saw you leave the room. I thought you were changing into your your, your, uh, your bathing suit or something. I was going to go for a run, but... Uh... He's in Florida, though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure I can tell you are. Uh, so, John, yeah, John and John Randolph and and, uh, and Eric Sigler as well. I want to get your thoughts and, and your perspectives to share with us. Um, yeah, I mean, Jordy, uh, I don't know where to start. That was a pretty comprehensive overview of uh, these complications. I mean, I the one thing I do like that Jordy brings up and talks about a lot is it's okay to leave an IA phakic. And I commonly do that as well. Complicated detachments, these patients are going to need oil for a long time, uh, bad news uveitis. I commonly leave them aphakic until the you know posterior segment pathology calms down and then put in a secondary lens at a later time. Um, so I think aphakia is not a disease, it's a condition. And that's a really good take-home point. It's okay to leave them aphakic. Hey guys, Eric here down in New York. Um, so I just want to add maybe a couple summary points uh, that are kind of pearls when you approach patients. And I think, Jordan, you hit on everything beautifully. But first thing is, what is the mechanism? And then what is the underlying pathology when you're dealing with a cataract post uh, vitrectomy? Uh, so is it physical contact or is it oxidative? The oxidative lenses, you can often anticipate that perhaps it will not behave intraoperatively like a post vitrectomized eye if there is intact anterior hyaloid. Also, remember to not underappreciate that the central nuclear sclerosis can be very significant and visually significant, um, but not look at first glance like a really dense lens if it's purely uh, The other thing is the underlying pathology matters in, in many ways. And so, of course, I think these days, hopefully all pre phaco or pre cataract surgery patients have an OCT done, which is pretty easy to do. And if no view, of course, a, a B scan. But if it's physical contact, of course, you can see either a cylindrical depression in the lens from a, from a physical contact. Um, hopefully the lens capsule has not been opened and, and left there, um, or perhaps the gas cataract in which you should assume that the anterior hyaloid is absent and therefore intraoperatively will behave as such, meaning we don't want to overly deepen and we want to anticipate perhaps, uh, you know, a, a hydrodissection issue or, or, or something of that uh, uh, nature. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is the underlying pathology. And I think one of the interesting pearls that not everyone might appreciate is that uh, the patients that have severe ischemia such as diabetic retinopathy, patients often do not develop uh, progressive nuclear sclerosis. So I often counsel patients that if they're having a vitrectomy for diabetic retinopathy, perhaps they won't uh, develop as much cataract because their oxygen levels are already low. They're already diffusely ischemic you know, uh, within their retina. Um, and then just one other point regarding YAGs in, uh, you know, or, or dealing with the cap capsule in, in silicon oil filled eyes, uh, you know, Jordy, you, you taught me this years ago. <laughs> you know, I can't believe it's been like eight years now uh, that, you know, when you- when Getting you old, bro. Yag, 
<laughs> yeah, you know, when you when you yag uh, PCO in, in these silicon oil filled eyes, oftentimes you get, you know, this perforation in a nice circle after sitting there for you know 20 minutes. But sometimes it just doesn't go anywhere. And what I've done recently, and and I prefer a surgical approach, especially if they're calcified or things like that, which are pretty easy. But what I've done recently, which has worked beautifully, is if you, you create maybe you know, 20 or so perforations without connecting them, you can pass a 30 gauge through the pars plana and just wipe that capsule away right in the office. I know it's a bit, you know, aggressive if you don't, not used to doing, you know, pars plane approach things, but I've had, for patients that haven't gone to the OR, some very good success with that. And it's been uh, pretty effective. There's something else that's important. So uh, I, I think it was John Lynn that mentioned this, I'm not sure that said that not all traps are the same. Uh, you have to recognize that not all vitrectomies are the same. There's, there's, you know, what we do for a vitrectomy is not the same uh, for every patient. And therefore, the, the changes that you're going to have, as you mentioned, the two main differences that we're going to have are, number one, the, the amount of anterior lens, sorry, anterior hyaloid present. And number two, how far peripheral this anterior, the, the, the vitreous base has been trimmed or, or, or removed. And what difference does that make to you guys as anterior segment people? Well, is that if, if there's a lot of work in the peripheral vitreous, as I mentioned, you can have uh, sonier changes. And the other one is, what about the anterior hyaloid? So if the anterior hyaloid has been removed, we usually try to avoid removing the hyaloid, but sometimes it's almost impossible. A typical situation is a dense vitreous hemorrhage on a diabetic. So you'll do, uh, and, and you'll, you've, we've seen this, uh, so you do a vitrectomy on a diabetic, and then the patient re-bleeds phacic patient post vitrectomy bleed. And uh, then you have this, what appears to be a four plus vitreous hemorrhage. But sometimes what they are is just a thick opacification of the anterior hyaloid with, uh, with retinal blood cells. And the only way to clear that up is to physically take away that anterior lens, uh, the anterior hyaloid. Uh, it, and so it changes what the approach is. So for example, some of this, the easiest ways to do a phacal uh, vitrectomy put the lens and then open up that anterior hyaloid with a, with a cutter and, and clear the visual axis. You can remove the hyaloid very carefully in a natural lens, but you have a, I mean, every so often we'll ding the lens on and, and have to do something about that. I wonder what we, when we have these, you, you know, three retina folks here, and we've heard earlier with Steve's presentation, some of the discussions around that, Maybe, I mean, you know, the reality is, listen, I mean, not every anterior segment surgeon should be, you know, manipulating and working behind the lens plane. But that being said, I think with the right training and the right equipment, I think many have had success, in, including in, in our practice. So, I mean, without, of course, saying, listen, you shouldn't touch it, but are there certain patients that maybe would be the, the cases to think about it? Or are there certain pearls that you think you can give uh, that would maybe- For managing, for from doing parts plane approach, Ike? Yeah, parse planar, or just even like working with vitreous, you know, in general. I mean, okay. not uh, let's, that's, cases, that's a know. very important uh, discussion. So let me let me back off to your original point. And, uh, and there's an issue regarding, as you said, uh, uh, different surgeons and different approaches. So one of the problems whenever we start talking about acutely on a posterior capsular tear doing posterior posterior uh, vitrectomy approach for 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 vitrectomy, obviously, um, is that Oftentimes, it is the guys that have the most capsular tears are the guys that should be least uh, getting involved with interior vitreous. You know, it, it's a sort of a situation. And not everybody is a great surgeon like Ike that can feel completely comfortable in dealing with these things. And so I tell the interior seven guys that the first thing is how comfortable and trained are you? If you're not properly comfortable and not properly trained, the best approach is to stop. And, and like I always say, this is the, the rule of holes. When you're in a hole, stop digging. So that's that's number one. Second, if you are going to avoid uh, to mess with the vitreous, there's a couple of things. Number one is do not pull on the vitreous. The vitreous is supposed to be cut, not pulled. So so you basically the vitreous cutter you want to use the fastest the fastest cutting rate possible, and the lowest vacuum that will do the job particularly when you're working with interior vitreous. So what you're trying to do is not pull on the vitreous. I, I always get a little bit clamped when I see anterior segment guys start moving things around when there's vitreous around and I can just see the peripheral retina tearing. So the point here is go to where you're gonna be and don't have the vitreous come at you necessarily. It's just go towards the vitreous and don't pull on it, don't yank on it, cut it the best that you can. Now, I think that's the biggest thing. And if you can't see the vitreous, use Tramcinolone. Transcendental works great to visualize the vitreous, you know? 
And once you've cut the vitreous, the interior segment vitreous that's attached to the back, sometimes you will cut it and there'll be a little bit that's still on the front around the, around the lens or iris. Well, it's okay to go and pull it off if it's not connected anymore. The important thing is not to pull on the retina. Yeah, that, that, that's, I guess, the biggest, the biggest issue. Jordy, we have, we have a situation where we can't get triacents in the United States anymore. So it's not available. I don't um, use triacents. I just use plain old triacinolone. Triacinolone diluted. Um, yeah. I, so basically what I do, and, and um, I, I'm not working much with fellows uh, anymore, but when I used to start fellows on the first vitrectomies, uh, what I would do is just get plain old uh, triacinolone you dilute it one in five to one in six. So I'll just get a five cc syringe and just pull it out and then inject it into the eye. Uh, it, yes, just like you were talking about earlier about the, um, uh, what was it, the acris? Uh, not the acris, the Gore-Tex. So yeah, tramcinolone works really, really well. Uh, the worry that you have is that you may have from the preservative some degree of inflammatory reaction. But particularly when you're gonna do a vitrectomy, you're by definition cleaning up the stuff that you injected. So I have never had an inflammatory reaction after using this sort of homeopathic dosages of Kenalog just to visualize uh, pictures. And I'm, I'm thinking that some people will have similar approaches. Can I, can I, can I make a, a comment? Um, we use triamcinolone all the time and I let it sit for about 10 minutes and you'll see the supernate and the clear stuff separate from the Kenalog. So you can just decant the clear stuff and grab the Kenalog and dilute that down and you won't have as much of the preservative. One of the points uh, I did want to make is that when you're doing an anterior segment procedure, if you know, if I think I'm going to need to do a vitrectomy, I put my ports in right at the beginning of the procedure because the eye is formed and sealed. Agreed. But if you have an anterior segment procedure where you're doing something, you say, okay, I have to do a vitrectomy. Before you start putting trocars in, it's really critical that you close the eye and form the anterior chamber. Because if you try to put trocars in a soft eye, uh, it really gets messy and you end up with vitreous coming forward and going out through the main incision. So if you're doing cataract surgery, say, you know what, I need to do a vitrectomy. Make sure your incision is closed, put viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, form it before you try to put trocars in. You want the eye firm. Absolutely. So, so I mentioned the point about the choroid, which is the, the unnamed uh, other element in here. And, and you're saying you're right. You're pushing on this lens, on this eye that's soft and things are coming out. But my biggest worry in these situations is that when you have hypotony, the choroid swells up. And remember, yep. you guys talk about the scleral spur from the perspective of the anterior approach, but remember that the that where's the retina, the hinge of the retina is at the aura serrata, really the hinge of the choroid is at the scleral spur. So when you have a choroidal effusion from hypotony, this is where you're gonna put your trocars. So if you have some hypotony, and specifically, if you're trying to put the trocar obliquely, so my, my, by the way, in these cases, I actually go completely perpendicular. Yeah. I'm trying to avoid going to the supracortal space. An infusion into the supracortal space is bad news. Now, uh, and I was going to say, you don't necessarily need to put all your trocars present. As long as you put one trocar where you can put your infusion later. You see what I mean? So that if I'm thinking I'm going to do a posterior vitrectomy, and I don't want to have three trocars or cannulas there in the middle that are messing me around. I'll just put one where I can put an infusion if necessary, do the rest of the work, and then I can infuse, fill the eye, open up the choroid, and then, you know, then do the rest of the procedure with that. So I, I, I want to just get the glaucoma folks in because there's been a couple of questions. And by the way, we still have 400 people uh, listening in here on Zoom and also on YouTube. So thanks for sticking around. Um, but in Silicon Isles, eyes, John and, and Richard, Tom, Tommy and, and, and uh, Marjorie as well. Um, when you put, when you do your filtering surgery and the patient has to have silicone still in the eye, the retina guy, so you can't come out. Um, what are your pearls? Do you use inferior placement of tubes? Do you go to cyclooblation rather than do a filtering procedure? I mean, obviously it's more nuanced question, but in general, any thoughts on that? John Lynn, maybe, or? Um, I, I think it depends on whether there's uh, silicone oil in the uh, anterior chamber that you can see in this stability and whether the lens complex is still intact. So um, I've done both uh, infranasal tubes, uh, usually choosing a bar belt or a superior temporal tube uh, in those situations. You know, many times these eyes have had uh, multiple uh, operations and their conjunctiva has, has many times been violated. So um, I tend to, to treat this more with tube shunts rather than to go to trabeculectomy. 
Uh, oh, although oh. If, you, if you have mobile conj, uh, you know, I think it's reasonable to consider a trabeculectomy. I would not do a trabeculectomy inferiorly as the risk of uh, blood bitis infection is very high uh, as demonstrated by studies. But, um, you know, if, if there's limited risk of having oil coming forward to the anterior chamber, I think doing your standard superior temporal tube shunt uh, could be indicated. So let, let me, I want to, I want to chime in on that regard because there's different issues on the silicone oil cases. Um, of course, when you have, you know, the, there's the good sort of chronic sort of patient, and then there's the major disasters with silicone oil. And, and I, I cringe when some of these patients get, get tubes in place. So can, uh, can I share my screen? Uh, am I sharing my screen right now? Oh, you, can, I, you can share a screen. Yeah, if you. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm I'm looking for where the where the share screen is and uh, Zoom meeting. Put your cursor towards the bottom. It'll light up. Uh, share screen. Okay, so that's not this one. It is this one. So this here. Can you guys see that? No. Okay. May, let me see. Am I doing something wrong in here? Uh, okay, so, oh, there we go. So share screen. Oh, I see. If you want, you can call an anterostegmic surgeon to help you out because we're at the bottom of the funnel with uh, Zoom. Yeah. So do you see this over here? <laughs> yeah. So what you're having here, this is a lipogranuloma in the subquadrantable space following an amid valve procedure uh, on a patient that has already a corneal transplant, as you can see here. This is a disaster of an eye. This patient had uh, trauma, retinal detachment, silicone oil, and this is a sort of patient that I wish that my glau my glaucoma uh, colleagues would do just a cyclophotocoagulation and leave it be, rather than that put something. So what's happening in this patient? She has a superior bleb, and the oil has been continuously draining through this through this tube into the subcontractable space, and ends up with this now. At first, I thought when I started seeing these patients that these were little silicone oil cysts, and I thought that I could like pop them in, in, in surgery, uh, and, and it doesn't work that way. This is a legitimate lipogranuloma. I have uh, pathology in this, and I'm going to show it if I can go back into my images in a second. So, so what I had to do in this patient, I had to do a, a pyridomy right around here, and then literally had to take all that mess away from here so that I can reposition this back into place. Take the, uh, the tube, the, the, the Ahmed, uh, remove the oil from this so that this patient can have, and I don't think you can understand from this, the mass effect that this is doing. So these are, these are pet peeves of mine that in bad glaucoma patients with bad retinal detachment, sometimes it's just best to do a cyclophotocorrelation and not, an, not a, uh, you know, a, a procedure that makes a hole in the eye and makes the oil go out. Jordy, one thing that I might comment on is, uh, you know, many times I worry about uh, driving a patient, patient into tysis with a cycle destructive procedure. So uh, one pearl I might say is, you know, you can always go back and add more diode laser. So, um, you know, if I do do a diode uh, on a patient like this, I'm definitely not going to be aggressive. Uh, you know, I might only treat with say 12 to 16 spots, depending on the preoperative pressure and and those sort of things, knowing that I may have to go back and add more, uh, yeah. but I do worry about these eyes that have been operated on multiple times, causing them to go into tysis, you know, with silicone oil. The other thing to think about if you're thinking about doing a cyclophotocoagulation is the low and slow burn, as opposed to the high, the sort of the high power, um, high power, quick, quick burn, low and slow, even in people who have relatively good visual potential can get that pressure lower and you can avoid some of that inflammation. I think there's something worth mentioning in this regard is that when you have a chronic silicone oil filled eye, oftentimes you're not going to have, you're not going to have a uh, tysis when the oil is filling the eye. I think it's an interesting sort of, sort of, sort of process. So you, you, the, the worst part about it is the fact that you have silicone oil in the eye, but also the silicone oil may actually be helpful so that you do not develop this tysis that you're, that you're worrying. Uh, as I'm speaking right now, I'm looking for the pathology of that patient to demonstrate what, to show you guys what a lipogranuloma from silicone oil in the subcontinental space can look like. Because it's not just simply little leak from a, from, from a tube. It, it actually has a, 
a pathological response to this regard. What do you guys think about these cases? I mean, uh, otherwise, these I don't know how common it is because I, I, I just did a few uh, tube shunt on patient with silicone oil and I placed my tube shunt uh, at the bottom of the eye. And honestly, patient went well, but I, I don't have tons of, of patients, of course, and I've never seen this kind of uh, lymphogranuloma, but I understand what, what can happen. So do you guys see this here? Do you guys see this here, guys? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so this, is, this is the lipogranuloma that I'm telling you about. Uh, so uh, I've got multiple images and now I'm trying to move them in, in uh, here. So what you're seeing here is collagen fibers. You're seeing multinucleated, uh, multinucleated cells here. And these empty spaces are silicone oil, okay? And as you can see, this is not a single loculated glob of oil. This is an inflammatory chronic foreign body reaction that creates this, and this is all around tenons. And it becomes a hard, literally a hard granuloma on the, on the, on the conjunctival space. Now I was able to clear it from the conjunctiva and put the conch back on, but my thought process in these cases is, yes, if you had done a cyclophotocoagulation, you could have basically avoided making a bad situation worse. Yeah, I think it's going to be very much an a individual discussion. I agree, Marjorie. I mean, I've had a lot of success with infro and nasal tubes, but I think the conge has to be in good shape and the silicone oil in the AC, it's a challenge. And of course, even in the posterior segment, it can migrate forward. I think the, the, there are going to be pros and cons for either approach. Um, so listen, I mean, we've had, we still have, we still have about 350, 60, 70 people still on board here. So I do want to call the meeting though. It's been a great discussion. Um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the glaucoma, the, uh, complex eye well and the retina stuff with cataract has, I think been bang on a lot of great comments from the chat group as well. So I think we can continue going on here. People obviously have, have free time like we do as well, but I do want to be respectful for your, everyone's time here as well. You know, Jordy, I just want to make a comment. You, there's like four Jordies on my screen here. I mean, you, you have like multiple. I don't know how. Here. You know, multiple personalities here somehow. So yeah, I, yeah know, this every so this, often when these pictures come in, you, you know, got to fill the room somehow, Ike. I, well, I think one of you filled the room enough. I mean, you know, with, with you, with you, we're going to give you and Saffron your own, uh, you know, your own, your own chat line. I think it was great, which is exactly what we want to hear. We want to hear different perspectives. And I think what's incredible is that, uh, and uh, you know, as you know, I'm an extra segment surgeon. Lots of attract to me. You know, uh, some of my former fellows are here. You know, we're we're in vitreous or we're managing vitreous all the time. But I do agree with the caution. I mean, people like Sa Steve Saffron, I mean, you presented wonderful cases. And Nicole, you do these cases as well. Uh, many of you here do these cases. And I think there's, you know, it's like doing difficult FACO. I mean, you have the training, you have the skills, you have the attention. Preoperative patient selection is important. I mean, I would be very, our patients, we're operating our old patients often. So they have PVDs, they got liquefied vitreous. We probably get away with a little bit more than maybe we should in a younger patient. You know, I'd be very mindful of a young patient who's got, you know, uh, intact vitreous and poster hyaloid attachments and things. I think I'd be more concerned there. We don't really operate on those patients, but I still agree with the caution. I have a great retina person I work with together and collaboratively, and I wouldn't dream about doing these cases if I didn't have that support preoperative and, and postoperative as well. So I think the, the words of caution are, 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 are important. At the same time, I do challenge our antiseptic surgeons to, um, you know, to, to sort of uh, handle these handle cases that can be a little bit maybe beyond their their expertise, but still learn with the right caution and with the right balance. Um, I want to just maybe just ask uh, maybe Nicole and Marjorie, if you have any other, any, any, any last thoughts, I don't want to make this a, uh, uh, you know, a, a discussion only about certain things, but any, anything else you want to add about uh, these cases or about life in general? I mean, I think, I think you uh, are spot on. I think of the pre-op evaluation. This is, Nicole, this is for you, by the way. I wanted some Skittles. I tried um, telling them about you, but you know. <laughs> But you know the preoperative evaluation and making sure if they're on anticoagulation to stop it a week before if you can, um, and counseling them about vitreous hemorrhage rates I think is important for realistic expectations. And then postoperatively, of course I examine the retina, but I also work very closely with my retina specialists in the community. And like Jordy said, they can detach you know one two months later and have a subclinical tear. So it's really important to follow them like family. Great. Marjorie, any, any last thoughts from you? No, thanks a lot for organizing all this uh, discussion. And it's very, uh, it's great to, to be able to share uh, our thought with um, different subspeciality uh, people, like uh, retina and cornea, uh, cornea people. I'm, I'm very pleased with this. Thank you. 
Great. Well, I, I just want to give uh, one more chance for anyone else to add in some comments. Er, Eric, you're you're very well dressed. Uh, you're you you you've uh, you've added some great thoughts. Any anything you, any other parting words you want to you want to share with us? Uh, thank you. Well, I just say thanks a lot for, for having me on the panel, and uh, I just echo what you said, Ike, which is that I'd encourage all the anterior segment providers to you know, get some uh, experience with some pars plane of vitrectomy, you know, even if you put an infusion in the anterior chamber, you know, and, uh, you know, vitrectomized posteriorly, it's much safer and pretty easy. And, you know, I'm in a group with, you know, 80 docs now and 40 anterior segment surgeons that I work with that, you know, I, I teach quite often and they've all, you know, been pretty easy uh, to get going with it. Um, and uh, and you should also consider regarding uh, Kenalog triacins. There's also now trimoxy, which is a mixture of moxifloxacin, which it, the dilution is one to three, we figured out recently, which gives you a little antibiotic and little less dense particles and, and works pretty well. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Yeah. And I think while, while people are often not operating as much, I think it's a great time to uh, review principles. I mean, why not? I mean, there's some great teaching on, on, on understanding vitreous anatomy. First of all, that's the first step of course, for, for understanding the anatomy and, and the physiology. And then, uh, you know, working on, on, uh, on settings, understanding the settings and what they mean, understanding the, uh, and working on practice size, you know, I mean, Nicole, you have a great, uh, videos and, and, and experiences using artificialized learning new techniques. I, I've heard your presentation, which I think, I mean, that that's what I would say if you're a surgeon uh, watching and waiting and, and, and sitting and waiting until you get, get back into the OR to try doing that, whether it's uh, a complex case or otherwise, I think it's a great way to kind of learn uh, these things now and, and prepare yourself. It's an opportunity you won't have and the luxury of having uh, when you're when you're busy in practice. Uh, Richard, you're, you're, you did a great job starting us off. Uh, I want to thank you for for presenting, I, I want to offer you any last words you may have uh, before we close off as well. No, thanks for thanks for having me. I was also thinking like with the silicone oil, just go back to that discussion quickly. Usually it seems like if they have silicone oil in the eye anyways, usually their vision is not great. And I end up doing diode on those patients the majority of the time. I feel like it just doesn't come up that often that I'm put in that scenario of trying to choose between a tube or a diode. But yeah, fantastic cases. Um, it's, it's awesome to see all of your surgical cases and hear those pearls. Um, definitely have been traumatized by watching silicone oil cases and managing silicone oil and, and some of those. So I, I appreciated those pearls. Thanks. Tommy, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, looks like you're in your dining room. Nice, nice spot to uh, hang out with. Yeah. My breakfast table, my, uh, my seven month old daughter, she, she did pretty well today, not screaming too much. So at least I had that mute button. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not a, not a mute button. And the video off button too, when you're you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. What you're doing, but no, thanks. Thanks for getting this together. Ike. this is great. No, thank you. Thank you. John Lind. Ditto Ike. Thanks a million for everything. This has been a great, uh, learning experience. Thank you. Well, thank you, my friend. Always great thank to hear you. from you and your, and your wise words as well. Jordy, uh, you know, thank you, man. You were driving in, uh, we saw you in the car. We see you in the office now and thank you for your comments and, and, you know, given that perspective from the back, I think you're on mute. Thank you guys. Love you all and stay safe with the coronavirus mess. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Steve Safran, you have a, yeah. you have a, you have a, you have a lighter choice of wood than my office. Yeah. Uh, um, we have a couple of questions that came up. Is that your guitar in the background, by the way? Yeah, it is. I used to play guitar. Uh, don't really, play okay. we, would, we would have yeah. had you play a little bit if uh, yeah, we yeah. knew that. Yeah. Well, then it's too late for me to show you, <laughs> but I can, I do have a, a one or two comments if yes, uh, you have time for that. Please, please. Um, the, the first is uh, in cases where, um, you know, I'm doing part planal endectomy, um, I, I think it's always a good idea to try to uh, do optic capture rather than put the lens in the sulcus. So if you can create an anterior capsular opening that's suitable for optic capture in any case, I think that's a very good idea. The second thing is that uh, in 4% of cases where there's a pars plane of vitrectomy, there is touch of the posterior capsule by the retina surgeons. That was uh, in actually 3.7% in peer review literature. And very often you'll get a plaque. Uh, the risk of uh, posterior capsule rupture in these cases is about 11%. So uh, if you see a posterior capsule plaque or in any po previously vitrectomized patient, you really want to be very careful uh, about uh, your hydrodissection because even if there's no defect, it can rupture adjacent to the plaque. It's like blowing up a balloon with duct tape on. It'll rupture right next to the duct tape. Um, and very often you can get through these cases without hydrodissecting, treating them like a posterior polar cataract, 
even if there is a defect, very often you can put the lens in the bag and not extend that uh, if, if, if you even in a vitrectomized eye. So I just wanted to make those points about optic capture. Regarding pars plane of vitrectomy, I, I think it's a tremendous advantage to be able to work from in front and behind when you're doing dislocated lenses. Obviously, there are techniques to this. And, you know, it's not something that you should be dallying and, you know, just fiddling around with. It's something you have to commit to. Uh, if you're going to commit to doing these kinds of cases, I think this is a fantastic skill to have, but it's just not something you want to, you know, you don't, you don't want to do it now and then. You really have to commit to it and learn the proper techniques. Thank you, Steve. Well, this has been a great discussion. Uh, we have people from around the world uh, tuning in. And I mean, we've heard a lot of great stuff on the chat group as well. And, and thank you. A lot of great people who actually uh, contribute as well to the discussion. So thanks, everybody here. Stay safe. Uh, stay in touch. Uh, I'm sure we'll see you on, on the web somewhere else again. Uh, sending you my love and peace and blessings and safety as well. Uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to see everybody, but uh, I, I'm seeing more people now than I usually do. Uh, it's just I can't come out and give you a hug or a or, or a shot in the arm, those of you who deserve it. Uh, so thanks again. And uh, as, as you all know, uh, we do our PRISM eye rounds every Saturday at 12 and Wednesday at 3. Uh, if you're interested in presenting a case or being on a panel, let, uh, let us know. Uh, Jeb has put up, Jeb put up the, uh, the email address, or you can go to our website again uh, and continue to use this uh, time to your advantage. I think sitting around and being paralytic and not sure what to do is, is the last thing to do here. Take advantage of the time whether it's a, a, you know, a novel way to take care of patients uh, virtually or learning new skills or professionally developing it or spending more time with your family. Certainly, I think my family's starting to get sick of me. I'm usually uh, in the air a couple of times a month, like many of you are, and uh, I haven't been in an airplane in a while, so I'm getting a bit uh, land sick, so to speak. Um, in any case, uh, wishing the best to everybody. Keep in touch. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, and peace and love again, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.